Councillors, I'm resuming the annual plan submissions and I, I welcome um, Helen and Leslie to the room from the tower. Uh, Helen and Leslie, just to let you know, we've had a couple of uh, apologies from councillors, all other councillors here, but an apologies from Councillor Rokawa and Councillor Pakitiora Hiroa. Um, we have had the council prayer and those sorts of things, so if you're comfortable, we'll move straight into submission, to hearing your submission. Um, you can be assured we have read your submissions and you have 10 minutes. And how you use that 10 minutes, which includes question time from us, is up to you. But I will be quite tough on saying 10 minutes is gone. And we're fine with that. So um, obviously... As Andy said, I'm Leslie Carter, I'm the principal of Ngatawa, and this is Helen Campbell, who is our bursa, and um, just we want to thank you for this opportunity of actually coming along and being able to talk to our submission. Um, we're really excited that the council is considering um, a footpath down to the corner of Ngatawa Road and Calico Line. Um, it, is, it connects us more to Martin. We see ourselves very much as part of the Martin community. That footpath would enable our girls and our community to access the town safely. I mean, we already access the town. As you <coughs> know. We are a big um, employer and we access as much of our resourcing as we can from the Martin community. And our girls on, on Fridays and Saturdays are going into town. They're going into town, obviously, to spend money within the Martin community. What we are increasingly concerned about is the safety of the road. And that is our major concern that road is um, the size of the vehicle is increasing the frequency of the vehicle passing the school is increasing it is actually really unsafe for our girls to be um, walking to town we want them to walk to town there is obviously um, well-being that is improved by by physical exercise you know that for yourself we want our girls to be walking in the summer they also walk in to access the swimming pool that we use as part of our sport offering. And I use that road frequently myself coming to and from Natara and I notice a large number of the Martin community other than, than the school are actually using that road for exercise. Um, just walkers, runners, people exercising dogs. So I think it would benefit the entire community because once they get down to Natara, well, we've got a, you know, we've got a large berm which um, makes that um, walk a lot safer, but until you get to that berm that um, is sitting outside in our tower, it's an extremely unsafe piece of road. So that's our major um, concern, is the safety of our students. But also, there is that um, extra advantage of the Martin community having um, an additional place to actually walk safely. Thank you. Can I see <coughs> questions? Absolutely. Um, first question, just to start the ball rolling here. Um, we've had a number of submissions. Some of the submissions are saying, are you in the position where you can contribute to the cost? That's cutting it to the chase in effect. Um, no. If we're going to cut to the chase, no. But I would say we contribute sufficiently to the community. It may not be visible, but it is certainly there. Thank you. Councillors, Councillor Darapetti. I, I was just wondering if you've got any idea how many people are actually using that potential our, walkway? Our, our, our girls, yeah. Yeah. our girls. So um, on a weekend, um, roughly um, a third to usually about a half of the school are in. So you're looking at 80 plus students walking to town, accessing town. Thank if you. we're talking about our swimming squad, we're talking about 20 to 25. Councillor Wilson, thanks. What's your understanding of the um, this pathway is going to look like? What's your understanding of its makeup? Well, I mean, visually, I drive past the Huntley one every day, which would be absolutely lovely. But even um, you know, a a path that's you know a metre wide that could even be as as Shell Rock, even though I, I know that's not um, inexpensive, but we're not actually looking for 
um, something that may be as grand as the Huntley um, pathway, um, but certainly something that clearly separates them from the road. We had two options, Leslie, that went out in terms of submissions, and uh, there has been a reasonable level of support, by the way, for your position. Um, but there's also the second option was, yes, we should do it, but wait until we get Waka Patahi funding. So, um, degree of urgency in your mind? Well, I would like it yesterday, to be, to be frank. You know, Every day is another day that exposes our students to um, to um, potential yes. accident and to risk. Have you had any parents or any members of the other question no. the safety of the girls in this respect? I'm not trying to lead the question. I here. wouldn't. I wouldn't say that we've. I've had a parent um, write to me and say that it, it's not safe. But um, hardly a week goes by that we don't have some sort of. Um, incident, if you like, with with a vehicle going past the school. I mean, that, that isn't necessarily pedestrian. I mean, myself in my car, I was run off the road by a large truck. Literally, if I hadn't got over the road, I wouldn't be talking to you today. So they come round the corner from the other end, from accessing State Highway 1. The, the slowing point to 80 kilometres is just outside our first gate. <coughs> it's still going in excess of 80 kilometres when they pass our gate um, and they just keep going. Thank you. Anything else from Councillor? Councillor Lowden. Do you see uh, changing the speed limit along that <coughs> piece of road? Um, another. That would, that, would be, the that would be hugely advantageous. And there is conversation at government level about speed limits outside Schools, schools yeah. but it's not immediate. If we were to advocate on that in terms of the speed limit, what would you suggest as a, um, as a speed limit should be applied? <laughs> Well, there's conversation at parliamentary level that it should be 40 kilometres per hour when passing a school, but even a reduction from 80 to 50 would help us. So do we have a number of slow vehicles that pull out of our gateway, like buses and horse trucks, etc. So they take some time to give a speed when they've turned out of the gateway. So speeding traffic coming round that corner and seeing them for the first time I hear a lot of very loud horns and aggravated drivers um, because they're suddenly faced with a vehicle slowly taking off. No further questions, councillors. Look, um, thank you very much for your time. Thank um, you. And we'll go through a process from here where we consider the submissions and decide on what happens within the annual plan and staff will come back to you with, with an outcome, basically. Thank you. Thank you for your time. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, we've been gone. <laughs> we've got, we had one cancellation yeah. at 2.20, right. so we now wait for Shane Casey. There may well be an opportunity where, for instance, um, <coughs> it's early, yeah. I'll move them forward to try and gain us time. But I'm a little bit loath to move people forward with 20 minutes, because mm. <laughs> it creates a difficulty. Yeah. Um, just with the speed limit along that road, I personally have been coming down that road from State Highway 1 and um, coming around the corner at the, the correct speed limit and somebody <clears throat> was pulling out and they didn't even look. Um, and uh, honestly, I just, just missed them. I had to go around them yeah. because they went across and it was just... If yeah. there's someone coming towards me, it would have been curtains for everybody, but mm, it's a difficult corner. <coughs> I know that.
that's the marked bypass. Is there scope for moving where that bypass is to move the trucks out of an effect town to a more rural no. bypass? Um, no. The only other way you do that is quite significant in terms of time, distance, etc. Mm. So one needs to remember that the bypass roads have been built to take the trucks. Yeah. The road that you shift them onto may well not have been. Mm. It's original work, original design and construct. <laughs> Is there enough room along the left-hand side of Calico Line coming from Natawa for a footpath? Because there's drains. I drove down there the other day, and it's mm. it's not much, that much space from the edge of the tar seal to the open drain. Yeah, and, mm. and one of the engineering results may come back and say there may be sections of it where we need to close the drain in mm. to actually provide a base for it. You're right, there are pieces there where it's tight. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and there are other sections where people regard it as their, their, their own berm mm -hmm. and sorry um, you know that is part of road reserve if they look at putting up um, what's it called the railing barriers, barriers and that sort of thing that's an extra cost again isn't it mm. it's like this morning the question was raised at OIT around the burnt out um, business and so and they referred to the land in front of it being council land. I would highly doubt that's the case. It'll be road reserve, uh, <coughs> state highway. Is that where the R90 memorial is? <coughs> I'm referring to the fertiliser bin. It's been sitting there for about 50 years. Yeah. Well, <coughs> not 50 years. Yeah, yeah. Very long time. And with that burnt building, it would cost more to get consent and stuff to carry it all away than then walk away from it, which I've which I've obviously That's done. That's what they've done, yeah. By the way, just to clarify something that people may have been confused over, in terms of the, the word tomb for um, the grandstand and tie happy, the tomb is, is another way of saying memorial. So it was a memorial. But in terms of iwi description, uh, some of these, they use the word to. <coughs> so, versus somebody in the European sense buried there as in a tomb, no. Um, Andy, in the um, historic I think the information that was in the comes out of there on the grants and proposed originally, there was, they talked about it being a um, monument to the World War I soldiers, but I thought they decided not to because of being a wooden building, it wouldn't be permanent. So I think the may have been misguided. Well, it wasn't a memorial itself. That's why it's called mm -hmm. memorial. It's, it's the park, obviously, yeah. 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 So I um, think it's a bit of a misnomer. Yeah. 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 Interpretation. And also um, more research, not before that. But that was a, 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 a um, Major points in the state because yeah. you know, it doesn't sound like you councillors are deliberating here. Right? Pardon? You're not deliberating, are you? No, no. definitely not. No, it's human no. clarification. It's it's clarification. Mm -hmm. Seeking clarification. <laughs> just asking a question. All right, I'm seeing him. Setting you straight, though. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> you might need to look at it. Don't hold back, do you? Time you live? Yeah. <laughs> Cindy gets up and goes <laughs> <laughs> What's in that tea? We need to get to the bottom yeah, of the tea. The bottom of the tea. Right. <laughs> this, way, this way I used to roll it. <coughs> oh, yeah, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Are these hearing quiet? <laughs> Carol's just yeah. checking that she didn't yeah. get I can't to the mute. Oh, no, no. Uh, too late now, it's incriminated <laughs> ourselves. Or at least Jim. It's Greg normally. <laughs> You're not reading the room again, Greg. So Jeez. <laughs>
Just me, because we are running a couple of minutes ahead of time. Oh, uh, we are keen to take you. Yeah. Right uh, nine years of annual plans, Your Worship. I understand that if you want to get the hearings moving, that's quite all right. <laughs> so, Shane, the rules are, as you probably well know, 10 minutes, including question time. How you use that time is yours. And um, you're welcome. Go for it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there is a presentation. Um, I don't know whether you've got that in your notes or not, but uh, I'm just gonna put it on the yeah, that'd be great. I'll read from that. We shouldn't be any more than 10 minutes. So here. Yeah, good afternoon, Your Worship and uh, elected members and uh, council staff. Uh, my name is Shane Casey. I'm the CEO of Youthline Central North Island. And I'm here uh, to uh, have a cordial uh, to you, your annual plan in regards to some funding for youth services. Uh, I just want to note and appreciate that you have gone out to seek submissions on a couple of topics. But as an elected, ex-elected member, I couldn't help but put my two cents worth in and, and try and go for some funding. So anyway, so as I said before, from uh, Youthline Central North Island, we're based in Palmerston North, we've been in operation there, there are whereabouts for about 50 odd years now, so and uh, flux and flows throughout, uh, throughout the time. Um, I just want to bring to your attention, uh, folks, our, our existing relationship with Taipei Area School. Uh, it's allowed us for greater opportunity to gauge the need for further support for services within the Rahui, and we're delighted to have the opportunity to extend and support further and commit our consistent presence in supporting Rangatahi to, Rangatahi to full their uh, potential. So our team have gone out to engage some feedback, and uh, most of that is around, if I could have the next slide, thanks, uh, on three. Thank you. Um, I miss having a click of it, it's all right, thanks for doing that. Um, so cutting short, of course, uh, our youth workers and folk have identified as whānau relationships, uh, lack of services and or access for resources, this is in the Taihapia area only. Drugs and alcohol abuse, family violence and housing. Uh, next slide, thanks. Um, this is our response. So already we have two, uh, we sorry, we have three youth workers going up to Taihapia every Friday. So we're asking for consideration for extension of services through funding. Uh, and we're thinking that it looks something like two youth workers in the main lobby on a Thursday afternoon, but we'd be there for the day visiting other schools as well. Uh, one counsellor, one-to-one uh, -one mentoring is what we can offer. Uh, we can pilot our recently developed alcohol and addictions program, uh, facilitate programs, small group work uh, around healthy relationships and that's sexual family violence prevention. Uh, tailor a program that best meets the needs delivered either at the lobby or at schools, folks. Uh, visit, connect with other schools in the Rahui and connect with local services, support rangatahi and referral connections and then uh, committing youth line to support Taipei throughout the school holidays uh, regarding programs in the library and the lobby. Sorry. Uh, thank you for the next slide. That'd be great. So as we just sort of draw to the end of the presentation, in order to extend services, Taipei will require financial uh, commitment or support, and it could be in the likes of a lump sum travel costs or just resourcing support. So we're pretty realistic because if you've read through your submissions. Uh, dear elected members, you'll, uh, you'll note that I've put a figure down there of just over 19,000 for six months worth of service. Uh, look, we've got to be realistic in the local government set about how much money you do and don't have. So, but also too, if you don't ask, don't get. Mm. Um, so if we just move on to the last, uh, the last, the next one, thanks, because that's in the notes. I'm just conscious of time if we just go to there. Just for reference, we've calculated the cost of two staff. So we're looking at 756 a day, including travel costs. To be effective, we'd like to see the funding established for at least six months. So therefore we've got our total of uh, 19 and a half thousand. Uh, just note that we are a not-for-profit organization. We're doing this at cost. We're already funding our services on Friday at cost uh, through third party funding. Uh, throughout a number of sources, whether it be COGS, uh, lotteries, lines, all those, all the good ones that everyone else applies for. Um, and also too, if we were successful in funding, naturally we would come and report, we would provide information to support our works in Taipei. Uh, your Worship, just with your permission, that's pretty much the end of, end of the uh, presentation. I'm happy to take um, questions from the floor. Thanks Shane. Questions, Councillor Wong. Um, thank you for your work in Taipei, but why is it just written in Taipei, there are not other schools in the area? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we're open to other schools and, and we've worked with uh, the, the college here in high school, the high school here, uh, Rangitiki College. Uh, but there's been many times that we've come out here, councillor, and only to have our services cancelled at the last minute. 
we are so thinly stretched, yet we're willing to see the need and have that answered in Taipei. Yeah. So we also operate in Dannyburg, Levin, in and around Palmer North as well. Councillor Targetti? Sorry, I just, um, clarification really. So you're up there on Fridays with three staff members and you're looking at um, bringing those three staff for another day a week? Yeah, absolutely. So extension of services in the Taihapi area. Thank you. Yeah. A couple of questions from me. So first of all, um, you pick up some national funding, don't you, from government? None at all. We receive no funding. Youth Line Central North Island receives no funding directly from the government. Next question. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, we have funding application processes through council. Um, are you aware of them? Have you used them? Yeah, so we've had discussions with some key staff in around the youth uh, component of Rangitiki District Council. And I don't want to say mixed messages, but it's a case of, well, we're just trying to find the right line here to go through. I think, you know, we've uh, held our, kept our gunpowder really dry and sort of waited to annual plan. Excellent opportunity to get in front of all the councillors and say, look, this is who we are, this is what we're doing, and happy to be directed uh, further channeled. Yeah. Um, we may provide some more. Councillor Kalkin. Um, you sort of mentioned in your presentation, um, and thank you for that, just around um, one of the things that's been identified as a lack of services and a lack of resources. Can you just expand on what you're proposing here is going to close out in regards to addressing that? Yeah, so we provide youth workers who will be able to feed into things, you know, things like mentoring school programs, but also one on one, that one on one mentoring component. So we've already identified some issues in Taipei around, uh, you know, for example, housing, family violence, all those sorts of things. So we would add, we would add into the community where we could address those concerns with Rangatahi one on one and or with groups. So we're providing services that we understand are not there. Yeah. Can you advise me how closely have you worked with Mokai Partia? No, our point of contact has been just straight through Taiwan Area School. Have they suggested that you work with Mokai Partia at all? Because so, yeah, we, we understand there are several iwi's up in Taiwan. Uh, we haven't we haven't gone to uh, to have those that cordial with them directly. As I said, look, you know, we're just we are very limited as far as our resources, you know, are stretched and our ability to get up and around uh, these uh, critical groups is, uh, is an ask. Thank you. Councillor Carter. Um, you're mentioning the councillor. Is that working with or over and above the ones provided by the Education Department? Oh, no, that's, that's working completely separately, yeah. So we're not, we're not aware of any councillor at Taipei Area School. Any further questions, councillors? No, well, thank you, Shane, for your time. Thank you. you. Know, process from here on. Yeah, I sure do. <laughs> All the best with your, your, your hearings and deliberations. Yeah, yeah, yep. the long days. Thank you very much. Come All right, over. thank you, Council. <coughs> Somebody just clarify who's in the room. Excuse me, excuse me, sir. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know you. You're here no, for. I'm just observing. I'm oh, just observing. Thanks. <laughs> so, so we wait until the next submitter will be. Then call. Yes, and this was the handout for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're going to
That's us. Oh, we're ready for you. Oh, hey. Sweet. You're a little bit early, but you're gonna... Yeah, we can wait if you want. No, 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 no. Get home early. Yeah. 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 No, don't let us be a handbrake at all. No. Yeah. Sweet as. So, Councillor, please. So, we have Ben. And Brad. And Brad. Come Thank on, you. hold my hand. Um, <laughs> so, moral support. Yeah. Ben, I'll talk to you Ben collectively here. Yeah. So you have 10 minutes, and which includes question time. We have received um, some maps illustrating exactly what you're talking around. Yeah. Um, but if you decide to use the 10 minutes entirely to talk, um, it removes the, the opportunity for questions. Sweet, yeah. Cool. Okay. Let's go ahead. Right, yeah, I'm Ben Cole. Uh, Thank you very much for inviting us along to have a yarn here. I uh, lived in Marta my whole life, about 34 years old now. Um, apart from a little stint I did in the Army, five years. I'm um, currently a professional firefighter out of Wanganui, uh, about five and a half years doing that, and nine years as a volunteer in Marta on my days off. Uh, got a two year old daughter and got another one due in August. Um, this is a little bit about me. Brad, you might as well give yourself. Quick yeah. yarn introduction. Yeah, I'm Brad Bell. I'm 36 years old. We've lived in Martin for um, coming on four years in September. Um, I'm a livestock buyer um, locally um, in the Rangitiki, Manawatu, and yeah, based sort of Manawatu, Rangitiki all of my life, apart from stints overseas, UK, um, chasing sheep and things like that. So um, yeah, that's me, two young children, uh, a seven year old Riley, and um, Leighton, our son, he's five, and they're at South Makarikiri School. And that's, uh, that's probably me in a nutshell. Cool. Um, I guess you already know what we're here to talk about. Uh, does everyone understand sort of where we're talking with the maps? And I made two pictures up so you can see what the current speed limits are. And then the areas that we're talking about, um, the circles in yellow, if you go back to the page with Henderson and I, Pookie Park at the heading, mm -hmm. that's where uh, I live at that house there. and with the black roof, and the second one's actually an early childhood centre. And they look after, what, it's about two-year-olds, so <laughs> five-year-olds, so yeah. a bit of a range, and she normally has three or four kids there most of the time. I'd say up to, uh, up to half a dozen, I'm not sure yeah, the exact numbers. Not, not but too sure on the numbers. Yeah, yeah. So at the proposal that we have is it's that 650 metres. Um, it's actually on that line, the Henderson's line in Pui Papa Road. That where the arrow runs to is 650 metres. Currently, that's 70 kvh, 70, 70 kilometres an hour. Um, the time taken to travel 70 k, that seven, uh, 650 metres at 70 k, is 33 seconds. My proposal, or our proposal, would be reducing that to 50, and that'll take it up to 47 seconds. So 14 seconds extra is all it's going to cost people to transit that area. However, on the flip side, with doing that, we reduce the stopping distances considerably for all our children and our family and friends and people that are walking along the road. So at 70k, 
to stop a car. So this is just from the uh, NZ Drivers uh, Licensing website. Currently, it, it states that it takes, including reaction time, the total stopping distance is 56 metres from 70k, from you seeing a, seeing a hazard, hitting the brakes, to your car stopping. Uh, and that goes up to 69 metres in the wet. So it's, it's quite a lot extra, right? And in the dry, uh, sorry, if it's reduced to 50k, it's 35 metres in the dry and 41 in the wet. So by reducing 20k's an hour, we're saving a mass amount of time. I know you know what I'm talking about when we talk about speed, Brian. Um, also, the, couldn't find much information about trucks, but it seems to be about 50% further for a truck to stop was, it was about the average that I could get for any vehicle traveling at those speed limits. Um, I think there is a bit of a probably a policing issue going on down there as well, where people aren't actually even following the limits. So I think they come up to the 70k and coast into the intersection. Mm -hmm. um, and likewise, they turn on to the intersection and just gun it to 100k and probably by about where we are, they can be doing 80 or 90 k's most of the time. I understand there's a policing issue. It's not so much a council issue. Mm -hmm. um, you got anything you want to throw in there? Perhaps, perhaps I can make a suggestion. Would you be comfortable if we open it up to some questions? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's where I am. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Councillor Duncan, Councillor Dalgetty, Councillor Duncan. Uh, thank you. And my question is, is since since the 70k was put in, yep. has there been a significant change on that road? Like, there is more houses being built on. Yes. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. So we, we had a quick count up on the way. We, there's about 12 or 13 houses in that 650 metre um, section of the road. Mm. With, that's a, that's it. Thank you for your submission. Um, I'm just interested. <coughs> have you talked to many people in the community, or? We've uh, spoken to the majority of the people on the area, and everyone's in agreement. Yeah. Thank you. Question from me: Have you considered petitioning council with those other names? Because that's yes. where my question was going yeah. as well. Yeah. Council Loudon, Council Moore, Council Loudon. Do you have any um, crash statistics? Is that uh, 650 metres you're talking about? Yep. Get you to Newman's line? No, no, so Newman's line, um, that's, that's probably about halfway-ish. I think it's actually a mile by a mile by a mile block. Oh, yeah. It's about 650. I was just wondering whether... Yeah, yeah, no, so, be so... Better to go right for Newman's line at 50. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of people that walk out there. Yeah. We, we always have people walk out. It's actually quite a nice mm. circuit to run, but I've walked out there once and I'm, I'm not doing it again whilst the speed limit. It's just too narrow. The road's narrow, there's ditches on either side, there's little no, there's no centre line, um, it just, it scares yeah. it out of me, to, to be honest here, it just scares me. If I could just say something there, I think it's quite a popular road, you've, you've got um, a number of stock trucks and freight trucks that like to use that road, and then they, they go out onto Newman's line, um, right, and then back onto Wanganui Road, so it's quite a, a common road for, for um, transporters, if you will, and I think, as Ben has said, like um, the people walking, biking, and certainly car enthusiasts, <coughs> you will, you know, they'd like to go out for a, a wee tiki tour, or, or maybe maybe more than a wee tiki tour, uh, in some cases, um, rather briskly. So, yeah, it seems like it's a pretty common sort of um, road, or more, busy road. Um, alternative road. Um, and I think one thing that, you know, I certainly have noticed is that within the space of from the 70k sign, we have it's probably approximately 200 metres um, from the 70k sign, uh, just before the 70k sign where the road works are. Um, the Dallows, I'm not sure if you're familiar with where I mean. Um, so the Dallows are just located, uh, they're at that ring road just before where the 70k ends up. <laughs> that ring, that's the Dallows property there. Oh, yeah. yeah, so it's, it's approximately 200 metres from there back towards um, Pukki Papa Road. And I think there's, there's did we have a count of almost <coughs> six or seven houses there. And within those six or seven houses, there's something like 17 children from the age of, you know, basically newborn to 15, 16 years old. So it's quite a, a congested number of, of children. Um, and then on top of that, you have the early childhood um, 
centre, yeah. So it's just, yeah, it's, it's quite a congestion of children within a short, uh, a short, you know, uh, stretch of road, yeah. I think the road's probably going to get busier as well with uh, the new subdivision going in at the other end of the road. I think it's probably going Harveston, to... Harveston, yeah. Yeah, Harveston. It's going to probably increase our traffic and we're going to be people moving towards Mart as well. Mm -hmm. Any further questions for councillors? Cool. Look, guys, thank you very much and thank you for the way you presented. Um, we will go through the decision making stage. We'll come back to you. That decision making stage it may also be useful in terms of further process going forward. If you have, where you say you've talked to some of your neighbours, whether there's some evidence evidence around that. Yeah, I will absolutely think. discuss that with you. And Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks, Ben. See you later. Cheers. Okay. <laughs> See you, uh, The next submission is from uh, David Studley. David, welcome you. Um, David, if you'd like to take a seat at the end of the table. Sure. You can take it as a given, David, that we have read your submissions. Um, you have 10 minutes in which to um, either expand on them or go over them, um, but it includes question time. If you use the loop 10 minutes speaking, it limits the ability to ask the questions. Thank you. The time is yours whenever you're ready. I have a few copies of what I'm going to say to pass out if you want, or do you prefer just to hear from you? Certainly. Thank you. Unfortunately, only five or six. Right. Council minutes, please record that we've the table documents. So basically, I've come here to talk about three things. Firstly, the inequitable burden of rates on farmers. Secondly, the ever-rising burden of rates that council places on us all. And thirdly, what I see is the very expensive and financially dangerous proposals to develop the properties in Martin and in Taihapi. I think they're wrong, it's morally and financially dangerous, and I want you to make changes to the budget, so I'll make my case. Uh, we have a family farm in Ruatangata Road in Wangaihu, two and a half k's from State Highway 3 with the river on our boundary. It's a small farm, sheep and beef, three, 236 hectares seven contiguous titles, and it's occupied by a 77-year-old farmer, his sister and brother-in-law, who are 68 and 67, so a small family. Our total rates bill for 2022-23, $14,362 for a family of three. Typical households in Martins pay, Martin paid three to $4,000, and where my parents used to live in Crofton, $1,700, $1,800 substantially different. What services do we get for paying three to five times what those people are paying? No footpaths, no street lights, no public toilets, no sports facilities, no pools, no libraries, no parks, no water, no sewerage, no rubbish collection, basically no nothing, just two and a half k's of road. And it's not very well maintained, I have to say. On top of that, we get to pay for all of our own services collect their water, store it, pump it, septic. If we've got rubbish, we take it to a transfer station, which requires quite a journey up to the dump and pay when we get there. If we don't like the taste of our water, we put in a water filter at our own cost. We don't ask for a big water system to be put in to give us sweet water. Uh, quite clearly, in my view, we are not a five times higher user of your services or a five times higher burden on the council than any family living in, in one of the towns. We almost never visit Martin, because we live on the extremity of Manutike, do everything in Wanganui, basically. And, and what I see is our rates, far from being our fair share of the communal services, the cost of those communal services, it's just an asset tax on us. And as an asset tax, it takes no account of our income or ability to pay. It's based on land valuations, which take no account of our land use. 
our, our land valuations are driven by the prices paid by dairy farmers next door and lifestyle blocks who bid it, outbid us by two to three times what we could afford to pay for land. Our land assets don't drive our consumption of your services. They don't currently at least provide us with an income to pay what you'd like us to pay for your services. And it's inequitable that larger, higher turnover businesses, which use a lot more of your services, don't get rated on their financial assets, their machinery assets or anything else. It's purely on land. So we pay out of proportion. So on to conclude that area, um, rates shouldn't be a mechanism for taking money from one group of people to pay for services to another group, services that we ourselves can't actually receive. Those who receive the services should be paying the full cost of them. And hopefully that will lead councillors and ratepayers to make better decisions than they make, particularly ratepayers in the towns who are spending other people's money on things that benefit them but don't, fend, don't benefit the people whose money they're spending. So first point, please stop asking us to pay way more than our fair share. I don't know if you want to take questions on the way through, but I can keep going at that pace if you prefer, and then questions at the end. Yeah, the, cho the choice is yours. Thank you. Um, the ever rising rates burden on us all. As you all know, we're in the middle of a cost of living crisis and we have fairly entrenched inflation. Many people are not in a good position to pay last year's rates, let alone paying 9% more. And, and maybe almost the most important message I have for you today is don't be fooled by the two speed economy. About two thirds of people out there are doing very well. They have six figure type incomes, even if they're school teachers or nurses, they're spending up large, but the other one third of people are doing it really hard. They have next to nothing left to live on. Um, to put things in context, when you vote to increase rates by 9%, you're probably thinking about, oh, well, in Crofton, that's another $150 a year. In Martin, maybe another $300 a year. For us, that means $1,300 a year extra which is almost as much rates as people pay in Crofton, for example. And over time, the compounding, you know, sort of the compound interest effect works against us. 9% increase over three years in a row puts our rates up by $4,237. And it's been happening to us year after year after year. And we don't get the services, so I'm not so happy. You also have to be able to pay. Um, about a third of our income has disappeared in recent years, where once our wool clip gave us a hundred grand net, right now we're paying people to share the sheep and we don't even get the price from the price of wool enough to pay for the sharing. We're about $20,000 down when we do sharing. We have to do it for animal welfare, but we don't do it because it's returning things. We had some wool sell for 11 cents a kilo this year, $15 a bale. Lambs will. David, just to advise you, you're about halfway through your submission time period. Okay. I think to me this my time. advice would be that, that we get the gist. Yep. Yep. Um, okay. If you want to highlight some comments and ask questions, right. then it's your call. Okay. We're in an inflation spiral, and by putting up rates, you're contributing further to the inflation spiral. People need more income or put up their prices if they're a business to pay your higher rates, which means next year there will be more inflation. It will be better if the council was hoping, helping to break the spiral. So I would like you to develop a better and fairer budget. Reduce expenditure and defer maintenance. Don't start new projects. Don't borrow and preserve cash. Exactly the things that normal households and businesses are doing at this time. Lastly, I can't be the equal most important thing here, but uh, these expensive and financially dangerous proposals to spend about $52 million on the Martin Civic Centre and the Taihapi Town Hall and Civic Centre. When I saw that in the Chronicle, I thought I better check the date. It might be April the 1st. No, it wasn't. And so I'm here to talk about it. There doesn't seem to be any re sufficient recognition of the scale of the costs and risks in these projects. 
and the lack of wisdom in borrowing large sums of money at a time of interest rates rising fast, budget and balance of payments deficits. It's going to be harder to repay these things. And maybe to put in context, if you guys spend 52 million in Rangatiki, that's the same as spending 5.6 billion in Auckland per capita, like the City Rail Link. It's a big project in context. Spending even relatively large, small sums like this in Kaipara got them in a big hole. They started off with a $10.8 million uh, wastewater project in Mangafai. Currently it's $60 million and they're asking for another $60 million to go forward. Doing earthquake remediation is not safe, simple or anything like that. Costs will go up. I see the projects as only nice to have, not necessary. Shouldn't be justified on replacing earthquake prone structures. Every, every building and council and community in New Zealand could bankrupt themselves fixing up the earthquake problem. They're not good investments. To be an investment, it would have to be, they would have to be returning an income stream back to the council. They're consumption. These are things that ratepayers and the small number of users will have to, to foot the bill for. So I ask you not to do those projects. If, if Martin really wants a civic project, Martin should pay for it, not the entire region. If, ta if Taihapi wants his town hall and civic centre project, Taihapi should pay for it. It won't be easy, but it is possible to raise the money and do these projects. Don't ask all the ratepayers for it. And there, I better stop so that you can ask me any questions if you want to. Thank you. Thank Sorry for rushing it through. No, 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 I did time, but it's... <laughs> Councillors, questions? Uh, I'll start. Um, David Thrustall, thank you for your submission. Yeah. In terms of where you say Tower Happy should pay for its hall, Martin should pay for its hall, etc., um, would you take the same logic that the roading, the rural roading, needs to be paid for? In its entirety by those people on rural roads because that is the dilemma that we face. Well, in, I guess in the old days when there was a borough council and a, I forget what the other word was, but the rural council, the rural council did pay for those roads, mm -hmm. except the government pays 68% or whatever. 64% mm -hmm. now pays uh, the deputy mayor pays 68% for the roads. Yeah, um, thank you. Just, I just want to seek a couple of a little bit of clarification on the actual submission that you put into it. Yep. Option one, Taipei Town Hall, and option two, Martin Civic Centre. Yep. Reject both options. Now is not the right time. So can I just clarify, are you saying no, do nothing, never, ever? Or are you saying no, but no, but yes at a later stage? There might be a time when people aren't struggling, when the country is flush with money again, and sure, bring the projects back then. But for the foreseeable future, I think we're in for some pretty hard times. So just, can I just clarify that? So you're not opposed to the projects, just the timing of the projects? And who's asked to pay for the projects? Okay, thank you. Any other questions, councillors? Um, we're in an annual plan cycle. The long-term plan cycle is an opportunity where you can look at how rates are levied, rather, it's just legal process, in fact. Would you consider submitting again sometime in the future on that? So I've submitted once before, I think you might not have been the mayor back mm -hmm. then, on the long-term plan, uh, nothing changed. Our rates kept going up, <coughs> exactly the percentages and so on. But of course, I, I would submit whenever I'm aware that submission is... Okay. Well, thank you. Um, we have used our time. I would, I thank you very much for your time. And uh, it'll go through the consideration process and we'll come back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I do Thank hope you. you read it all. Oh, no, no. Yes. And, and we are hurt now there, so I hope you can do some, at least some of it. Please don't borrow all that money. <laughs> Your time is impeccable, gentlemen. Exactly. <coughs> uh, Peter, you're going to be first up. Okay. <coughs>
um, you will have 10 minutes. And Tim, as I understand it, you want to speak on the spatial plan and the annual plan? Only that it has impl uh, implications for the spatial plan in my submission. So, yeah. so, so it's really, it can be considered as an annual plan submission, but if you accept what I say, it would have a spatial plan implication. The, the short answer to that is, are you going to be requiring 10 minutes or 20 minutes? 10 minutes will be more than that. Okay, thank you. That's, thank you. that's useful. So are you going to all yeah. move to that end of, and, and we'll take uh, the first submission from Fed Farmers. And however you wish to speak to that gentleman is your call. Um, I suspect that especially Tim knows the rules and he will as well around submissions in which you have 10 minutes, including question time. Um, how you use that time is yours. Uh, you can rest assured um, that councillors have read your submissions with interest, I must say. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Your Worship and councillors. Uh, with me today, I have Ian Strawn. Ian is the provincial president of Manawatu Rangatiki, replacing Murray Holdaway as of last week. Yeah. Yeah. And Tim Matthews, He's also going to help answer questions about forestry differentials. So um, thank you for the opportunity to be heard. Uh, my submission uh, on behalf of the membership is relates to rates increases, the forestry differential roading, the various proposed civic projects the council has um, proposed and the three waters infrastructure costs. Uh, the main points that um, were on page two of my submission um, that we've been telling councils all through this year that council the councils have introduced um, amendments to their annual plans to please cap your rates increases to no more than the rate of inflation which is 7.2 percent at the present time um, we also are seeking a four times forestry differential for um, logging trucks and other logging vehicles. I went to the workshop in Hunterville some months ago where the question was raised about what the council might do about payment from forestry interests. And I understand that that still hasn't seen the light of day yet and so the council is thinking what to do about the forestry question and we our view is and our membership's view is don't delay any longer please put a forestry differential in place uh, tim can speak more about the the numbers behind the reason for four times forestry differential but i, I do note that why our district council has put a four forestry differential in their rate system, which was challenged by the High Court, but thrown out. Um, and so there's a precedent there if you want to um, follow that. We also urge the council to reduce expenditure um, in these, at this particular time, Beef and Lamb have announced a, a third percent drop in um, farm profit this year for um, fibre and meat. Ian um, is in, our, in the position on our executive of being a sheep and beef farmer. He's also been a previous dairy farmer. He can talk um, a lot more about the impact, projected impact on farmers this year. Um, at this time, we're thinking the global economy it hasn't um, bottomed out in terms of the current nosedive it's in, and it's not a good time to undertake projects which we might call discretionary projects such as doing up um, municipal buildings and other things which aren't essential. So we think that those things should be put off till a later year um, as to when that might be, maybe three, five years away if the economy has improved um, by then. Um, but we also think that the Otara suspension bridge needs to be fixed up because that's a, a major um, bottleneck for people wanting to get stock out of um, the hinterland area 
that that bridge serves. Um, the other points uh, are standard points in my submission. I'll, I'll hand briefly over to Ian to talk about the impact on the economy um, and the projected. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Yeah. yeah. Okay, th and thanks again for the opportunity. Um, yeah, so talking to a farm accountant a couple of weeks ago, um, this this current financial year for agriculture is going to be quite ugly, and that's in all, all codes. Um, we, we're, we've been running at, um, farm inflation has been running at 15%. Um, Lamb's down a dollar a kilo from what it was last year. Dairy's down, everything's down. So um, both those things give a double whammy to to, um, to net profits. So the lifeblood of the region is going to be suffering this year, um, and, and farmers are going to be down on down on income substantially, um, and, and adding more cost pressures will actually uh, be to the detriment of this region, adding more cost pressures to farmers. So I'd just like to emphasise emphasise that point and. and, and can take more questions on that if, if needs be. Yeah, and, and, and the effect going forward um, from 2025 with, with Haywak um the uh, emissions um, tax um, that's proposed, um, it's, it's not been confirmed what's happening yet, but mm. potentially that's going to uh, take another, uh, on average, sort of eight to eight to $15,000 off, off, uh, off the bottom line of um, and add on to costs of of uh, sheep and beef farmers anyway um, in this region, so that's going to be significant. So there's a lot of headwinds in agriculture. So uh, yeah, so farmers' ability to be profitable um, and, and, and contribute and, and what is the lifeblood of the, this region's economy uh, is going to be significantly affected. So you just do take that in, into account um, with with your uh, setting setting your rates. And Tim, do you want to talk about the forestry? Yeah, just make a very quick comment about the effect of forestry. I don't know if councillors realise that a logging um, operation on a small road is actually increasing the use of the road by about 40 to 60 times in terms of the weight and number of product going out over what was a strictly pastoral type operation before. And that's why we feel that there ought to be more recognition in the rating uh, differentials or the rating process that says, look, this is exacerbating the damage on the roads. You need to reflect that in your rating system so that the rest of the ratepayer base isn't paying for one sector. And in fact, I'd probably go farther and further and say, look, you really need to look at your road rating system or the, the way that rates are collected, probably for industrial and commercial sector as well. So currently, I pay the same rating rate as the supermarkets in town or a mill in the district. Yet there's probably not a fair reflection of the actual use of the roads. And I think we ought to need almost go back to first principles and say, look, where is the cost to the rating system occurring and how can we design a rating system that fairly represents that in terms of rewarding those people that don't use the roads and those that do. So. Um, and this being the year before a long-term plan is probably the best time to start considering that so that you can include it in your long-term plan um, calculations for next year. Thank you. Are you happy to take some questions? Uh, first of all, William, congratulations on your appointment. There were a couple of us there at the AGM. Um, Glad to see you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> In terms of the, you're saying you want council to restrict ourselves to the inflation index as a 7% uh, CPI, but you also say that the, the farm inflation rate you're seeing is 15%. Um, you know, councils face considerably higher rate, probably, of inflation in terms of roading. And what services do you want us to cut back on? Bearing in mind that roading is probably 30% plus of our total budget. Mm. Um, anything that is not a, a long-term um, business as usual service, such as the municipal building project, the walkway um, in Martin from the railway line. Yeah. And there was one other one there mm. that I mentioned in my <coughs> submission. Because it's not stated where the Calico line attracts a subsidy 
from NZTA. And if it is a danger for people using the walkway, shouldn't that be reflected in whether NZTA subsidises it or not? If it's going to be of a size or intensity that reflects danger to the people using the walkway, shouldn't that be reflected in the subsidy? Because most footpaths are unsubsidised. Um, and the other two projects were the Tai Happy Memorial Park and the Martin Rail Hub. We think those could be trimmed out of the budget. Um, if the, the, the Martin Rail Hub sits with governmental funding to by far, far the greatest expense. Um, but I'll open up further questions for councillors. Councillor Kalkin. Can I maybe just seek some clarity on something you mentioned around the forestry differential? And you said that um, when a, a forestry block is being um, you know, logged and things like that, it increases that road's use for 40 to 60 times compared to its usual use. How does that, or in, in your mind, how would we create something or what could we create that allows for that as a one-off versus um, uh, an agricultural farmer who's got stock trucks on a, a weekly basis using that same road for 30 years. So that's, <clears throat> I guess, that's a problem for the rating system because the foresters really only want to pay for roads when they actually use them. So at the start of the rotation, they've got people planting, people tending, perhaps pruning, um, and then a little bit of forest management, not much traffic perhaps compared to the, the pastoral neighbours. But then at year 28 or approximately, then suddenly you've got this flood of gear coming in, first to establish tracks and roads, then to get haulers and cable loggers and all those sort of things to the tops of hills. And then you've got the trucks bringing in metal and stuff to get them there. And then the actual logging trucks start. And so there's a really a, intense period at harvest of the forest. So do you have a rating system where you either rate them every year for the life of the forest, or do you have a system where you say, at harvest, we're going to charge you a fair and reasonable rate for that period of harvest? And I haven't seen a district council yet that's been able to achieve that second point. And I think you probably need to talk to the forestry people and say, well, how would you like to pay for roads? I think you've had a bit of that already, but. The important point, is it enforceable from a local government act perspective? Because whatever you design for them must be capable of ensuring that they actually pay the rates. So you can sell my farm if I don't pay my rates. Um, if the forestry people are getting together and saying, oh, look, we'll make a donation or a contribution to the roads, how are you going to enforce that? It must be capable of enforcement. So we're just over time in terms of this first submission. I'm wondering if you're, if you're going into your second submission. Yeah, happy, might, well, happy to cover that then yeah, too. So what I'll do is reset the time. Yep. And, and you have a further 10 minutes. No further questions for Federated Farmers um, then? We've run out of time in yep. terms of that I, I see that you're offering, offer, operating as a conglomerate here, so that's <laughs> fine. So, so you have another that's... 10 minutes collectively, how you use it? Yep. No, no, that's fine. Do you guys want to yeah. shuffle off or are you happy to sit yeah. here? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not a problem. It's quite important to... Just shuffling my submission, yeah. sorry. Thanks for right here. for any other questions while well, Tim's we sorted. <laughs> I've got so, to be very no. mindful, gentlemen, that this, I'm fair to all parties here. This is my personal submission. It Thank doesn't you. necessarily respect, reflect anybody else's position. So um, I've just made some points. So firstly about what the uh, annual plan asked about <coughs> the town hall and the Martin redevelopment. I'm suggesting delay those. Same with the active pathway Calico line if it doesn't attract a subsidy that makes it more affordable, then perhaps we shouldn't be doing it. The introduction of the forestry differential, we've already covered a fair bit of that. Uh, and the other point I make is a roading service decline, and it's really asking the question, is the council actively managing 
what is happening on its roads and are the contractors actually performing to the requirements of the contract? Because I don't think it's been happening on the western side of the district. And we're only half an hour from Martin, so we're not actually at the back of the beyond quite. We do have a lot of forestry around us though. Um, and I'm just wondering, is this a reflection of what's happening in the rest of the district? Are the contractors performing? Are they being paid for what they should be doing or what they're actually doing? <coughs> And does the council have mechanisms and policies that allow them to make sure that they are paid for what they do each month, basically? <coughs> Can I, do you mind if I just ask one little sure. question there? Are you asking the chief executive to investigate the efficiency of those services? Yes, that's, that's the very the final clause of my submission, I think you'll find. Thank you. 21, clause 21. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So that's the basis of my submission. I think while you're thinking about the forestry things, also be aware that carbon forestry is going to be a huge issue for this district and the neighbouring ones. And it's going to be a huge issue for the district council too. For people that plant a forest and effectively shut it up, they don't need an awful lot of council services. In theory, they'll be paying the same rates as the rest of us. Uh, but then at a certain point, and if currently it's around about 50 years, they no longer accumulate income from carbon. At that point, the forest then becomes a liability to them, but also to the district. And what happens then? How do you manage a position where you could have 10,000 hectares that's effectively left to, to waste effectively and be replaced by native? bush and I think we need to start thinking about that in terms of the long-term plan as to how you ought to rate those sort of areas for instance I've just tried to find my two new neighbours that are carbon forests in the rating information database I cannot find them nobody's come to me and say look I hey I'm your new neighbour um, what are we going to do about trees falling over fences you know how do we return stock that sort of thing can't find it in the database so not a good start as far as actually sort of living day to day with our, our new neighbours, it's going to make a huge sea change, I think, to the way this organisation operates. And the other question I'd like you to ponder is, should you lose three waters, what's going to happen to this organisation? Because you probably need less than a dozen staff to run what's left. Can you do that? Will you have the income that it was a little bit skimmed off the top of the three waters in terms of overhead charges that would allow the council to do a few other things. That's not going to be there. It's going to be lost. And is it, in fact, a good idea to be looking at new buildings if, in fact, you need to amalgamate with one, two, three, four of your neighbours, in fact, to, to actually provide the services that you provide now exclusive of the three waters services? Something you really need to think about in this coming year. Welcome, any questions, if I've got a few minutes left. Thank you, Tim. Um, one, one, one question for me, and, and it's just on the roading one, uh, you made that as sort of a general statement about roading. For, do you, or even as, um, you know, with your feed farmers hat on as well, is there a specific issue on the roads that you see out there? Is there a specific matter? Because you just sort of said roading in general and degradation of roading across so, the district and the country. I would suggest it's the maintenance and the efficiency of, of getting stuff done. We've had very little done. And in fact, after I put the submission in, we've had seven days of work from Higgins on our road, which magically appeared. We'd seen very little. So what, sorry, what was the nature of that work? Was that culverts? Was it potholes? It was one culvert at the end or... dropped off. Yeah. They re replaced that, moved it further up the road. They've actually made the bit that dropped out in February last year. They've widened it by a metre so we can now get trucks and trailers past with a little bit of safety, but it's not actually repaired. It has taken them seven days to actually get this road back to a stance. It, it's not quite ready for winter, but it's a lot better than it has been for the last 12 months, 14 months. So, and, and the question that we're asking on our road is, is the council aware of what's happening with the maintenance? Do they know what's happening? Uh, or are they not actually aware we're still paying out the money each month for the contractors to do their thing, but is it actually 
being effective? Are they meeting the terms of the contract? We've got no idea of knowing. We never see the contract. And it's really up to the council to ensure that the management of the contract is being carried out. And I think from a little bit of hearsay around the district, it's not just our roads on the, on the western side of the district that are a problem. Councillor Duncan. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, my question is, I, there are a few things in here that I um, highlighted. You said on several occasions you've requested metal to be spread. Um, that was unsatisfactory. You've said there was poor or uncompleted work, incomplete work. And um, you also feel that people are not listening to the locals when it comes to the work that's been done. Obviously, this work, some new work has been done. Um, did you, uh, one thing, first thing is, do you ever use the Rangitiki District Council's um, request for service facility? I've never used it yet. No. But um, as a way of giving information to us to so that we do know more about yeah, that? I, I think there's probably, it, it's, the contractors don't really know who is who on each road. There's, it's, there's a very poor correlation between who lives on the road, what happens on the road, and what the, the contractors do. And that's partly, I think, a, a roading management issue. Partly, the, the contractors are quite happy to talk to us about spoil dumps and that sort of thing and getting rid of stuff, but it's not sort of proactive. And I think we ought to have better ways of communication. We've got a fancy GIS system, but nobody seems to be able to use it to say, well, this person lives here. Um, we're thinking of doing this roading program in the coming year. Why don't we talk to the locals and say, look, how can we do this more efficiently, save the contractors some money, save the council some money, and probably get a better outcome for the residents on the road. And that just doesn't seem that roading sort of seems to happen to us as as ratepayers. It, it's not sort of asked for or talked about prior to it happening. And I think that could be useful. And, and part of this, the spatial plan part of my submission was cycleways. We've got a lot of cyclists heading through from Wanganui to Hunterville. They're not ideal roads for cyclists. And the spatial plan needs to think about how we can get people to travel safely along with trucks, tractors, stock, all the other sort of things that happen in the, in the hill country, because there's going to be um, an unfortunate accident, I would suspect, in the next few years, just with the level, the number of people that are using the roads and the, the sort of conflicts between those sort of things. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Further questions from councillors? Look, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Um, your submissions um, have been on the nose. They'll be well considered. And there may be some subsequent follow-up conversations, Tim, as, as often as the case. Um, we, we take on board your concerns and position. And we'll go through the, the process, as you well know it. I take on board your comments around some of the issues are LTP considerations and that we have a year to sort that. Well, well we're working on it now, I should say, <laughs> but, but it's a year for and that and again acted. But thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Cheers. Thank you, man. Um, we we are running a little bit ahead of. Sorry, I'm not. I can't see who's beside you on the. Yeah, he's, he's he's yeah. John, would you be happy to give your present your submission now? Yes, yes, yes. Um, that would be incredibly useful. Yeah, if you um, Helen Craig coming in today sometime. Too. Yes, but we'll just. Um, all right. Yeah. So, um, councillor Sard, welcome um, <coughs> past Mayor um, John Vickers to the table. Um, 
Thank you, John. You will know how these processes work. You have 10 minutes, including question time. I'm full of admiration. You know, I know what you... It's a, it's a long day and a lot of, lot of talk, a lot of, a lot of work, a lot of understanding. So, John, Very important, though. Your submission is on the, uh, on the annual plan and community special plan, pages 74, 77, councillors. And the time is yours, John. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I've, I've got a heritage hat <coughs> the, uh, uh, being a member of the uh, Wanganui Regional Heritage Trust. I'm the Rangitiki rep, and so I, it's my job to keep an eye on things over here, and, and I've got a love of heritage, and I'm very aware that not everyone does, but Martin has got some significant um, assets or they could be assets, they've been assets in the past that um, uh, pose a few problems. And, uh, uh, but um, things have been happening and, and there are people that have come to the district because of these heritage buildings and they have got capital. And so that's a ray of hope and they're interested in these buildings, and, and Helen Craig will tell you the same in Wanganui, and now a uh, different set of circumstances and further along the track. Uh, but they, uh, they have got a name as leading the way in conversion of old buildings to suit today's needs, which is basically the name of the game. And then there's the other issues of uh, uses for these buildings, and generally it seems to me Provincial New Zealand has got twice as many buildings as they actually need. But so that, that's a problem, especially for a place like Martin. A building that hasn't got a use has, has uh, got a major problem. But things are changing, and while they're, if they're not lived in, they, they can be unsightly, and the verandas have to be propped up, and they annoy people, and all these sorts of things. I'm not a fan for rushing to uh, um, do uh, to make change, or <coughs> time will be their um, ally. I I believe because we've got some very good quality buildings in the main street, and it's hard to see that in the, in their present state. But I'm uh, and this building uh, has my. Um, admiration too and I, I it's designed by an architect who um, built s some of the best buildings in the town the old Bank of New South Wales now Tower School and when it came to strengthen those buildings they found it was a major job to get the rod drilled through to put the rods in and and that they were far better buildings than were assessed and assessment is something that's uh, changed over the time. It was pretty rough and ready after the earthquake and nowadays uh, assessments are much better and uh, solutions are there to be considered as well. So that's, um, that's part of what I want to say, but I, uh, I uh, Tim's concern about the, the roads and so on is, is another one. Um, it's always uh, roads are vitally important to our district, especially the backcountry ones and uh, uh, commitment to the national network through uh, uh, the uh, transit or uh, Te Waka Kotahi or whatever it is. Um, they, that is absolutely critical to us. And, and in my day, 51% of the budget went on roading and um, it's, uh, um, we are very reliant on those subsidies, as you will know. Um, so uh, the municipal buildings, I wonder whether um, our, the size of our community can quite justify our aspirations. So, Lovely as it is to have them, uh, they um, um, 
it's it, it is an ambitious program and i think we need to heed the lessons that the cyclone gabriel's are teaching us that about infrastructure that um that boring word but if you haven't got it you've haven't got very much at all and and we need to have our infrastructure in the best possible shape and be ready for these things i live on the tutanui stream and we've got a flood retention dam of uh, 40 years standing that holds the water off martin but uh, martin i think needs to consider balls because the water that's uh, going into storm water from the new concrete and roofs in the town is uh, will have an effect mm -hmm. and uh, um, I can see some issues coming up in the future there, but I haven't got anything specific, but I'm happy to take questions. And questions from councillors. Councillor Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Vickers. Very nice to see you here. Thank you for your um, submission. Um, I just wonder, the people of Martin seem to have said that they'd like the main street revitalised Yep. And that's one of the reasons why councillors looked to to invest their money in those in that site and those buildings which they own. So um, I see you you say you prefer us to remain the the council buildings to remain here. How do you think that would affect the town, the main the main street in town? Well, I I don't think it's going to be critical to. Martin, well, it would certainly be a major block, but um, yeah, you're moving to a floodplain and you're, the, the, there's lots of good parking around here. And this building was very carefully considered and it needs reconfiguring inside, um, the, out, the outside is. And this has been reconfigured and over time and as parts of it have. And uh, I can well imagine all out that way is, is not, um, purpose built or anything like it, but I believe it could be made a lot more useful. And um, yes, it, it, there are a lot of ifs and buts about, uh, to me, uh, of, about moving to the main street and if there are uh, private individuals wanting to to um, step in there and do things, I'd be. I think that's um, a, an option that should be encouraged too. Any further questions, councillors? Councillor Wong, uh, uh, Mr. Vickers, just um, on the Taipei Town Hall um, civic site. Uh, I, I know you're not a Taipei resident, but you've tipped the option two, which was the um, earthquake strength of the Taipei Town Hall, but shifting the Civic Centre library to the bottom of the grandstand, was that something you intended to support, or was it just a... Um... Well, yeah, it was a difficult um, um, thing to, um, um, to tick, I suppose, because... I worry about the town hall being, um, you know, it was never fully restored upstairs, is still shut off, isn't it? And, and um, it's, it wasn't ever, didn't ever come from the ratepayers of Taib. It was given by uh, local people and it, it's, um, it's a f maintenance is the, uh, the big concern, I think. And I know it's lovely to have, but and there's mention of the ballet coming, but they only come once in five years or something like that, don't they? And, and I know the people of Taipei love their town hall, but um, uh, yeah, the, we got the, the grandstands being, um, has got a future. And I, I, if you can make these buildings more useful, well, that secures their future. And I, I think, if there's ways of um, doing that, uh, it seems quite a good idea um, uh, to me, if, if that can be, be done. But I know it's, I'm doubtful that the town hall as itself can be strengthened and um, 
made useful. It's a huge job if it if it can be achieved. Mm. Be the last question, Councillor Moore. Um, <clears throat> same question is for the Thai Happy Town Hall. What about the one on the corner of High Street and Broadway? The buildings that the council owns. <clears throat> Well, it, one of the options is a new build anyway, and I can, I can, can see that being a likely um, show. I think it's got a better show as for if there were private people wanting to do something there, I, I would be all for them doing it and, and leasing buildings back to council or with council help, sure. Yeah. But ownership and driven by by private individuals rather than council. I, I don't think it's council's okay. and we'll call business, it, really. We'll call it quits there. John, thank you very much okay. for your submission. We know you know the process. Um, I would welcome um, the Deputy Mayor of Wangnui, Helen Cray. Helen, and acting mayor for quite some time. I was. I enjoyed every minute of it for the roads plenty of time. Hello, everybody. Now, this is not a bribe, but I was in hearings yesterday, and by 2.30, and now you're at 3.30, my, my sugar levels were getting low, and it's a fact that if you've got a full tummy, you're going to receive the information better. <laughs> so please pass around the chocolate fish. <laughs> Helen, you, you know the process. Yes, You exactly. have 10 minutes, including exactly. question time. Uh, how do you use that as your, your choice? Um, thank you for the thing that is not a bite, but we need to move on. Absolutely. I'll let that go around. Feel free to make lots of noise. I'll speak loudly. I'll just have to get up my... So you can rest assured we've read your submission. Thank you very much. Um, so I just wanted to talk to you about uh, what your vision is for your town. Uh, you might know that, um, I, well, I was chair of town centre regeneration in Wanneroo, <coughs> so I've got a, and I've been a councillor there for 10 years. Um, we and have invested a lot, a lot in our town, and having a vision was actually vitally important to getting where we are today. I'm also chair of the Wanganui Regional Heritage Trust, so I've got a strong interest in heritage. So having a vision for your town is actually really important, and, I, and I'm, so I'm posing that question to you. Um, you know, are you going to be known as a heritage town or a tourist town, or are you going to be a service town to the rural economy? And I do think you're at that crossroads at the moment. If you want more than being a service town to your rural community, and you want your town to thrive and attract more people, um, <coughs> then you are going to have to invest in your townscape. And look, farming families, our reductions um, in our rural communities is happening. Uh, we're a rural community as well, and we know that we are losing people out of our rural community, and it's just going to keep getting worse. So the towns, if they're going to have to have, uh, be rel stay relevant, are going to have to attract people who are just not rural economy. So, when you, th when you think of the cool little places that you want to go to in New Zealand, in your provincial towns, what are they? I can think of Arrowtown, Cambridge, Greytown, Hamner Springs, there's a few more. And what do they have in common? They've got their heritage buildings, they're set amongst beautiful trees, walks, ways, parks. They're easy to get to and offer that touch in New Zealand that we used to be. And New Zealand is use, rapidly losing that character and you just have to go to the big cities and and, and they're just looking horrible. They're just, um, you know, autobahns really with a few shops scattered around. Um, but people are looking for experiences. Uh, they want that short getaway that uh, leaves them rejuvenated, excited. They're looking for more gems and more interesting experiences as, as well as really cool places to go and live. And I think that your towns can be added to the list of gems. You have all the ingredients, you've got all of them. You just have to start a program to enhance and keep what you have. Um, it is doable, but council has to get behind it. So if you look at Whanganui, we've pulled ourselves out of, out of the downward spiral. 
we made some really bold decisions at Council to strengthen our heritage buildings over 13 years ago. 13 years ago, I can't believe it. But we instigated it, at a, we put in a 2% rate, um, which was basically a loan repayment so that we could get on with earthquake strengthening. Um, and then we also started to invest in the soft stuff like walkways, murals, lighting, etc., cetera, um, outdoor dining and the CBD. And that was largely led, led by a town centre regeneration strategy. So now we've got the Sergeant Art Gallery, the Royal Wanganui Opera House, the Alexander Heritage Library, the Wanganui Regional Museum, and the War Memorial Hall have all been strengthened. I can't believe we did that. You know, we are not a rich town, but we did that and we've done it. We've got new vibrancy brought on with um, lots of new young people coming in. Uh, professional people, people just want to run cafes, it's, it's just ice cream parlours. It's really exciting and they're opening up great new businesses. Um, we've now got a growing school population which is even more exciting for our future. You know, and we do have a very low socio-economic base. We always have had that. <coughs> and we could have easily said we can't afford to earthquake strengthen the buildings we had, let alone run them for the operating costs. But we did it. And I think you're in the same boat. If you don't invest in your towns, I think that they'll just struggle. They'll just struggle to remain relevant and will only just be servicing the rural populations. And the talent will go elsewhere with those towns who do develop them. <coughs> Our population went from 43,000 and declining to 49,000 and still growing. Our economy is reliant on farming, just like yours are. We've got some lots of spin-off businesses. And whilst we have a large town as opposed to lots of small towns that you have, um, you have the advantage of being close to Wanganui and Palmerston North, and it's an easy drive from Wellington to attract interest. You've got amazing scenery, easy access to things to do in the surrounding towns, and the best grand homes anywhere of New Zealand in your countryside, and they're a great attractor. You've got great schools, major airport close by, and you can sit alongside Aratown, Cambridge, <coughs> Greytown and Ham Hamner Springs. You just have to decide that's what you want to do. Um, if you pull down your heritage buildings, well, no private uh, owner is going to invest in their buildings. Why would they? If you can't do it, how the heck are they going to do it? They're going to say, OK, you can, if council can get rid of your buildings, well, we'll just get rid of, you know, what incentive is us to go the extra mile? Because believe me, it is not economically easy to save these buildings. And what would you build in their place? I, it, it, you, you'll struggle, you know, as a council you'll be able to build something new, it'll be concrete and steel and glass, and you can put a, a fancy exterior on it. Um, but you already have beautiful architecture, you've already got the beautiful exteriors, and why wouldn't you utilise that? And actually they're unique, you'll never be able to build those again, or actually they are unique in New Zealand. You've got quite outstanding architecture that is unique and one of a kind in New Zealand. And they will add value to you in the long run. You just have to get over that initial hiccup of they're going to cost some money. Um, it's also a greener option. Uh, rather than putting everything into land and pool, the lowest carbon footprint that you will have is actually to do them up, even if you are taking away some of the interior. So I do have a personal vision for a West Coast region that is rich in heritage, arts and culture. And you're very much part of that future. I've always looked at Wanganui and thought, my God, I hope these small towns save what they've got, because then we've got, as a group, a much stronger um, heritage and arts and tourism option and attractor. And look, it is happening. I look at your citizens, and I know a lot of them, and they really want to get behind it, but you've got to. Councils have to take the step. And I've had building owners who say, are you going to get behind this whole heritage thing? Because if you're not, as a council, if you're not, we're not going to. So we have got behind it. And it's modest, apart from the earthquake strengthening, but we've done it. And people are getting behind it. It's a slow journey. There is no silver bullet. But I'm absolutely confident we are getting there. So I think you guys can do it. I really hope you do do it. I think you have got incredible gems and get that investment done. And I think we've got a great future as a whole region. And I think it's really strong. And I, yeah, that's it, really. Yeah, we've got a couple of minutes left. Have you got, you prepared to take some questions? Absolutely. Councillors.
Councillor Wilson. Um, thanks, thanks, Helen, and I do appreciate that you wear you wear two hats. You listed a whole lot of buildings and things that you've been involved in, all, but that heritage Wanganui have been involved in. So I'm trying to understand what has your involvement been? Has it been by funding, by advocating to what actually has Heritage New Zealand done when it's come to these buildings? So the Heritage Trust that I'm on, which is just a private Heritage Trust, uh, it's a, a non-for-profit in Wanganui, and we've, we, you know, uh, John's been a member of it, you know, we're trying to have that long reach. The, the Trust has run, so we've got run, started to run Heritage Month. You might have heard of that over the last couple of years. We did the Her Heritage Awards about three years ago, and now we're rolling out a Blue Plus project. So we haven't invested in buildings as such. What we're doing is celebrating heritage. You can't, you, if you celebrate heritage, heritage and start rewarding people who have done things in heritage, people start getting excited about it. And when we first ran Heritage Month about four years ago, people went in the community and said, oh my God, we've got heritage worth saving. Oh my God, look how amazing our heritage is. And I was like, yeah, you got to tell people you got great stuff. You know, we've been on national TV. They've said, oh, Wanganu is now the, the Paris of New Zealand or the Paris of the Pacific or something. <coughs> and it's like, this is national TV personality saying that. And why? It's because we're sending out this message and saying, we're a great heritage town. You know, and now we have people coming to us and saying, oh my God, you guys are so amazing. We're so jealous. And I'm thinking 10 years ago, I was going everywhere else and saying I was so jealous. And now people are looking at us. And so the difference between what council has done, we've strengthened our heritage buildings. So we've made that commitment and council have put money into town centre regeneration, which is, I could tell you more about that. And the Heritage Trust has celebrated it and got the word out. And that's made it the fun bit. And that's got the hearts and minds. You're not going to get there if you don't win the hearts and minds. That's why I was just trying to get that sorry. Yeah. between the we're, two. We're at time. time. I'm sorry. sorry, Helen. Yeah, that's um, right. I have to call it class. I can come back any time. <laughs> 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 I know. But it's all good. Thank uh, you very thank, much. Thank you very much. We yeah. understand. Thank you. Understand thank you. There's some for the staff. <laughs> they need oh, it too. Lovely. Thanks, Mike. You've been our favourite supporter so far, wasn't it? And Belinda. And Belinda, welcome to Council. Belinda, we have your submission. You can assume councillors will agree it. Um, you have 10 minutes. How you use that time is your call. That includes question time. First time off. Hand these around while I talk around. And it's to do with poo. So, there we go. So I've got enough that we've got it. Can the record please show that it's been table documents sent? Thank you. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, hatua. Your Worship the Mayor Andy Watson and the sitting councillors. Thank you for letting me speak to my submission. These are dependent from Martin Community Committee. The Martin Civic Centre. Most of you would have read my submission. I prefer to something else. At this stage, sorry, I need the old crutches. I listen to our citizens. Since submission, I have learned there are more struggling in, our, in their new builds, existing builds, due to their mortgages needing to be serviced. <coughs> Keep up with their families to the life they are accustomed to. Before the economic downturn in New Zealand and increased prices of basic foods, especially those made in New Zealand, this is affecting people of all walks of life, from working students to our high pensioner numbers. I'm very much aware there has been lots of consultation to and fro at council cost. I can see we will eventually get upgraded council buildings one way or another. If your constituents rate payers and renters and our community see our mayor and council members initiate the completion of projects not quite finished, it would be a benefit to all. Just to name a few, other than the town centre revitalisation plan and the sabbatical plan. Number one, the dog poo bins. These come in red, orange, black and green. For an extra cost, not a lot, you can put the eyes and nose in, which are made in the same moulding. 
These were passed in July 2018-19 in a budget, especially for the Sir James Wilson Park. But I can see there are other parks and walkways and in our Green Village that need them as well. These are purchased by Manawatu District Council, Palmerston North City Council and other councils, councils around New Zealand. Through Stallion Limited at $290 plus GST, which includes a hard plastic liner that sits inside to hold the disposable bag. So what you do is you pull it out, put the bag, take the bag out, put the bag on and put it back in to hold the disposable bag for an easy emptying by council staff, which means they don't get their fingers dirty. Number two, Memorial Car Park, final stage of the new playground and upgrading of Memorial Hall. And three, cleaning and replanting Broadway Ave of our township. Water blast the footpath and wash frontages of empty buildings. Transfer and replant the bare areas of our gardens. Clean and restain wood seating that is popular by all. Or as they say in the sabbatical plan, town centre revitalisation. Is there any questions from that section? <coughs> Keep going. It may be useful if we take questions at the end yeah, uh, no, with cool. the time we have available. Linda, thank you. As you also would have read in my submission, I have ticked option one. As the existing road side of the road is used by Natawa students, runners, walkers and families with push chairs, my suggestion for a quick fix that keeps it in the budget is the crash wire that has extra protection for those larger vehicles then there is reflector poles as well that are in white and orange. The footpaths could be added permanently as part of the negotiation with the developers as stormwater drainage could be expensive for council to absorb. Purchase the housing land is in frame 23-24 annual plan on Calico Line. Very wet water retention land and draft community sabbatical plan. Anything else? Well, I do have a few. Warning tactical indicators or decision tacticals predominantly used for, uh, to warn our sight and vision impaired people. But you put these at the entering of hazard areas, particularly to pedestrian crossings. If it's narrow, when the blind person feels it, they know they're limited in walking just that far ahead. If it's a wide area, they know they can move cautiously to the side. Sight impaired are not just those walking, but folk that use mobility scooters and walking frames means they remain independent in our township and enjoy our township accordingly. These are available in cut sheets, solid brass, polyurethane tactical studs, or concrete pavers or PVC blocks. That is the end. Any questions? Any questions from councillors, please? Uh, just, just I, I might have missed it. The doggy do. How many bins are you requesting? Like any or suggesting? I haven't requested any. I'd like some put in each playground oh, and, each, right. and on the walkways because we've got. It comes up on Facebook. Yeah. And you know, I'm a dog owner. I take my bags. Mm. I pick them up and I put them in a food rubbish tin. Yeah. Now, some of our community unfortunately dig in our rubbish tins. Mm. And there's nothing worse than, mm. oh, mm. doggy poo. Mm. So by having a nice bright doggy poo bin, you can actually incorporate it into, like down at the playground, you don't put it in the playground, the new playground, mm. but you can actually put it back where the toilets are. So it actually incorporates into the surveyors <coughs> of the playground. And you can do it in red or orange or the theme of the playground. Red and green ring ticky colours. Exactly. Let's not get that bogged down there. Okay. Um, <laughs> Councillor Morn. Yeah, again, on the same subject. <laughs> Did I hear you say that it was promised for James Milk, Wilson Park in 2018? It's correct. That... When Ethel was here and he moved on and it just did not come to fruition again. So when we put the seats into Wilson mm. Park, the new seating, and they were supposed to be put in by the walkway before the bridge and then on the other side of where the boxing oh, yeah. rear street entrance is. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. <coughs> Thanks, Linda. Just on uh, your key choice three and of your written submission online, 
you've got a number of stats regarding schools, pupils and percentages. Where does that information come from? It came from their websites. From the school websites, so it's websites. it's current, current it's and current. as at date. Thank yes. you. Any further questions for councillors? Councillor Duncan. Thank you. Thank you, Belinda. It is very well thought out. Um, I appreciate your time and energy. Thank you. And um, great suggestions. Uh, around the um, footpath, I just wonder if uh, you've asked to wait and apply for funding. Um, given the climate, this could, could uh, lengthen out the whole process, but you've also got other projects you'd like to see in the same vein. So... Um, they're obviously not not urgent, these other crossings as well. You, you're happy to, to, to see or wait? I'd, I'd like to see more pedestrian crossings for the schools, but I also know what it costs. They've just put in pedestrian crossings outside the school. But the one in Wellington Road, when you sit down in Wellington Road and watch how many kids run between vehicles mm. and wait, I mean, I know there were two children hit in around 2019 outside, within a three month period, outside James Cook School. So not James Cook, um, Martin Junction. And I was a second car back. Mm. Yeah. Subsequent question, Your Worship. Mm -hmm. um, so in that case, you're actually saying that that Wellington Road should be put ahead of the Natawa one. You'd like to see that prioritised. Thank you. Further questions, councillors? No, Belinda, thank you very much for your submission. Um, councillors, in terms of timing, we have the submission from, from Dean uh, Heritage New Zealand. We'll take that submission and then we'll take a 10 minute break, having been at this for a couple of hours. Yeah, is some of this presentation going to be online, I presume, Dean? No, nothing online. Right. Dean, if you'd like to join us at the... So, Dean, thank you, very, <coughs> thank you very much, and thank you for Heritage New Zealand's um, submission to an annual plan process. Um, you have 10 minutes. How you use that time is yours. But it includes question time. Sure. sure. Let's Thanks. go ahead. Um, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Dean Roman Taku Ingoa. Uh, so, from Heritage New Zealand, um, I'm a planner by background, area manager is my role at the moment. Our area covers Lower North Island, Tanaki, Hawke's Bay, down to Nelson, Nelbra, and everything in between. Um, I'm Kia Koto, I'm Ruben Dobe, I'm a conservation advisor in the region that Dean has just mentioned. So, thank you so much for um, the opportunity. We appreciate um, visiting Martin today. It's, um, it's a pleasure being here. Um, so just very briefly on the submission we've lodged, I'm sure you've got it. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope you've read it. Um, regarding the Taihapi options, um, as you can see, we supported the, um, the first option to fully restore an earthquake strength in the town hall slash civic centre. Uh, I note that's a council's preferred option in your consultation document. So I don't think I need to say more on that. Regarding Martin, our submission um, supported a second option. Um, I'd just like to draw out a couple of things from your documents. And I'm just looking at your draft spatial plan here. And it says here uh, on the third page, I think it is, Martin has a potential to become one of the region's most desirable boutique towns by leveraging off its heritage buildings as a unique point of difference. The heritage buildings reflect Martin's strong and proud identity, and if challenges associated with funding, their attention are able to be overcome, their adaptive reuse represents a key asset for the Martin Town Centre. So with that vision of heritage, which you as a council obviously have, um, we just strongly advocate that. Take the option of retaining uh, these wonderful heritage buildings, which we had a managed to have a look at as we arrived in town today. Um, there's a lot of reasons for it. Um, just one more comment from me and then Ruben will add a couple of things as well. In your, um, this consultation document about the annual plan, 
you've got uh, advantages, disadvantages, and risks for both your options. And both options talk about resource consent requiring are required for demolition or refurbishment. And the risk level is very high because resource, recent, resource consent is required for both options. So it's true that resource consent is required being um, under the heritage rules of the district plan. However, um, I'm sure the risk level in terms of um, the cost of resource consent, the likelihood of opposition, the likelihood of appeal uh, is much higher for the demolition option. In terms of our position, um, we'd be quite likely to oppose a resource consent for demolition of the buildings. However, if you chose the option of uh, refurbishment and retaining at least the facades of the buildings, we'd be very happy to be engaged in that process, provide advice, work with your designers, your architects, and uh, be supportive of that option. There may, of course, still be opposition from other parties, but I think having Heritage New Zealand on board supporting that option goes a long way to reduce that risk level in that option. Um, Ruben might add a couple of things um, speaking to our submission. Yeah, thanks, Dean. Um, yes, yeah, so um, the buildings in question have been recognised as a Category 2 historic place, and um, it was quite clear driving into Martin today that these buildings make an important contribution to the local streetscape. And our reports have identified them as being local landmarks. And so our view is that these local landmarks, as Dean has said, should be retained. Um, we think this is a really exciting opportunity for an adaptive reuse of heritage, where you can retain important heritage elements, as Dean's mentioned, the facade, but also provide modern fit for purpose um, utilities that the community needs. Um, we, these buildings have been around for around 100 years and we really want to see them contribute to Martin for the next 100 years. Um, another important thing um, is the, the environmental cost of demolition. Um, demolition waste in New Zealand is 40, 40 to 50 percent of the total waste going to landfill. Also when you consider the full life cycle um, of a building and embodied carbon, there is nothing greener than reusing the existing building and building stock, um, particularly as it helps to curb emissions by prolonging the useful life of materials that are already in place. Um, so I guess to summarise from our view, there's retaining heritage, but there's also there is an environmental aspect as well that should be considered. Are you happy to take questions, gentlemen? Thank you. Yes, we. Questions from councillors. Uh, Councillor Kalkin, sorry. Um, thank you, gentlemen, and um, appreciate that you took the time to drive in and have a look at that building um, beforehand today. Um, <coughs> lends me to my question on your views around retention versus protection, <coughs> and what I allude to is the fact that you you know you look at that building and you can see the the state it's in. The amount of time it's going to take um, and the risk that, that that poses. So interested to hear your views on retention versus protection. Um, if I take your meaning right, it's um, <coughs> we understand there's obviously uh, seismic issues with the buildings, there's refurbishment, there's a lot of work that's needed. Um, we're not um, interested in taking a purist view where you need to retain every brick and every aspect of that building and restore it to how it once was but to retain the main heritage values of a place and especially especially the streetscape mm -hmm. the architecture the main the main uh attributes of the buildings and i think taking a realistic and workable approach is, is what we'd like to work with you on <coughs> I'm just wondering if you've given any consideration to this building here along those same lines. Um, not specifically, but I know my, uh, my director was here meeting with um, our CE and the mayor a couple of years ago, and he did note this building as 
um, it's a great opportunity if, the, if and when the council moves out to the other site, that this place could hopefully be taken up by somebody and adapted and reused for a suitable purpose. It's, it's a, certainly a great um, facility for somebody hopefully can, can make use of. Thank you, Councillor Duncan, Councillor Wilson. Councillor Duncan first. Thank you. So, um, so what you're saying is that uh, the, the statement that is in the um, Paitafti, um, the uh, spatial plan consultation doc, um, about this, about our heritage town, Martin and its historic values. You're actually supporting that Martin is in effect, in fact, a valuable um, heritage town in, in itself at the moment. It is, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Wilson, do you know how many heritage buildings are listed in Martin? I could find that, but I don't know it on no, the top but, of my head. No, I, I, I know the answer. I'm asking if you know the answer. <laughs> This isn't uh, we have looked at it, but I don't, I don't, I don't have the figures. Call right now. Yeah. Thank you. And of course, there's the New Zealand Heritage List, and then there's the Council's District Plan, and they may not be the same list. Any further questions? Well, gentlemen, sorry, Councillor uh, Just one of the issues we're facing is just the cost of what we might do. And um, in Heritage 2, um, are you, um, is there any funding available? At, at, You've, you've mentioned that um, you might provide architectural services or advice and those sorts of things. Is there any monetary um, funding from our organisation? We have a fund that's available for private owners of heritage places. So for a council building, um, there's other options. It may be the lotteries has actually a bigger pot of money than we do, and we could write supportive letters if, if that's something which you could look at. If you've got half a minute, can I raise something else off topic? You've got literally half a minute. Mungaweka Bridge, the, the road bridge which has been closed but retained for cycle and walking. We're submitting on the Manawatu's district plan heritage change, asking them, can you consider putting it in your district plan? The question raises, it goes across both councils, of course. So if and when you come to doing district plan changes, please consider the Mungaweka Bridge. That's all. Thank you very Just much. You were bang on your 10 minutes now. Fantastic. Thank you very much for your time. Councillors, we'll Thank take a break much. for 10 minutes. Um, <sighs> You've done this before, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
So, um, Joe uh, and Keith Gray, thank you. Um, we have read your submission. You have that time available. How you want to use it is your call. Um, please proceed. Thank you. And Kia ora koutou. So our um, submission is going to focus on the spatial plan and then we were going to talk about a couple of things that we'd like to um, have included in the annual plan as uh, some uh, local priorities. So first I'd like to congratulate the, the um, council on the spatial plan. We think it really reflected really well our community's views and if it reflected our community's views as well, then I'm you know, assume the same for, for other communities. So there's a few things that we want to talk through about some of the actions that we think could be enhanced with perhaps, um, uh, perhaps a little bit of wording change, but also a little bit about the how we might do this into the future. So a little bit of the what and a little bit of the how. So when we look at the actions that um, relate to the healthy communities and unique communities, um, which is the access to open space and nature, the three... Uh, actions that are in there, we think we'd like to advocate for the development of a reserve management plan in the area. We've talked about this um, previously in a few um, different council um, submissions that we've done, but what we'd like to see is that developed as a sustainable umbrella for bringing these particular actions in under. It would remain community-led, but every year we'd work with the council and Horizons and Ngāti to agree a plan as to what we were going to do in the coming year. We've demonstrated as a community that over the past three years that we've got the will and the capability to drive this work with the, uh, the work that we've done on the wetlands. Um, but it is contin but continued progress is contingent on being successful in different funding rounds, um, particularly with Horizons um, biodiversity funding. An investment of about 5,000 annually by both RDC and, and Horizons each would enable continued pest management, both plant and animal, and planting of the reserve. We're keen to see the outcome of the parks, open spaces and sporting facilities strategy to see how this approach might align with that recommendations. This approach could also assist with readiness for the planned enhancements for the Te Araroa Trail. Action 2.1, which is around the Papakanga block. So whilst we've developed direct relationships with Chris Shenton and Leanne Horoti from Ngāti Apa, we'd like to strengthen these with local hafu. With no work currently underway in the Papakanga block, we're conscious that many of the weeds growing there are the same as what we're removing in the adjacent reserve. Some of these weeds, like bone seed, are identified for eradication in the Horizons Pest Management Plan. However, our area comes under a good neighbourhood neighbour approach versus active management by the council. We've had initial discussions with Leanne and have offered support to work uh, alongside that with our key partners in the project, which are, who are land-based training. So this work could also be identified and under that reserve management plan umbrella. Action 3.1, invest in the development of the public toilets and showers in the campground. This was completed last year and was an excellent example of council and community partnership in action. The facilities are now top notch and the campers and visitors are very complimentary. This year we've put in a proposal to RDC for funding to raise the level of the non-powered sites adjacent to the playground to make this area more accessible year round due to the rising water table out there. We're waiting to hear the outcome of the budgeting process, but are keen to see this progressed to ensure a better experience for campers, especially those that are on the Te Araroa Trail. So we'd request a change to that action to be invest in enhancements to the campground, just as a general um, action. Action 3.2, consider rezoning of the Kuitiata domain to an open space. We'd like to see the wording strengthened in this to reflect the recommendation in the plan. We don't think it's the, the word consider seems to take it uh, out of that action space. Residents are excited to see this recommendation and are keen to see it move forward as soon as possible. Action 4.1, advocate to Horizons to address flooding issues associated with the lagoon. So you'll be aware from rec recent papers that have been to council that the surface water area, uh, surface water issue has developed wider than just impacting on the lagoon now. We've received an update from Damien Wood about the council's position on addressing the surface water. And whilst we are disappointed, we agree that progressing the required consent process would not be a good use of funds. The saying, using an elephant gun to kill a fly, comes to mind. 
However, we would like to see this action reframed to recognise that the water issue is now wider than the lagoon and that we are all part of finding a mountain to sea solution. We'd also like more information um, about what we can expect from advocacy from the council, so the, the, the wording around that. And I'd like to um, express thanks to Peter for putting um, Damien onto that work and actually you know, looking into the situation for that. Action 4.4, work with the community to educate about climate resistance, uh, resilience, etc. So as past and present members of the Volunteer Fire Brigade, both Keith and I know that Fiends don't do training um, that focuses on flood management because it comes under the Civil Defence umbrella. We have um, have an updated community response plan, so we worked with Paul Chafe to do that, and but we'd like to work with the council to improve our community's preparedness for a flooding event, including appropriate training and equipment is on hand. So we think that's something we need to be a bit more active about out there. So in closing, we'd like to identify the following as our priorities for the upcoming annual plan. Rezoning the domain, development of a reserve management plan, and I'm very happy to do the legwork for that and bringing the parties together, um, and improving the non-powered campsite area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are you happy to take questions? Yes. Questions from councillors? Yeah, walk me through the rezoning, but again, what's the benefit of that? The so at the moment, it's fee simple land up in the domain, so it could be subdivided. It's owned by council, is my understanding, right. and it could be subdivided, whereas putting it into a rezoning it into a domain, oh, right. whether it's easier because it sits adjacent to the reserve to coming under the reserve or as a separate mm, yeah i'm not yeah, quite sure what the yeah. process best no, process would be but i've got the gist yeah, yeah. yeah. but essentially you're wanting long-term protection long yeah, protection. yeah. 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 councillor dalgetty councillor duncan councillor dalgetty uh, interested do you sort of know the numbers coming through the tower or trail so we were told this year that there's about 1800 that are doing the full trail um and 4000 doing parts of it and that's likely to increase. So I couldn't tell you that we've had 1,800 through the campground, but we've certainly had hundreds. Ca the custodian, the campground custodian, uh, January, January and February was getting 100 a month mm. for you. staying at the campground. Mm. Mm. Uh, Councillor Duncan and myself, Councillor Duncan. Uh, thank you, you mentioned that um, you were looking perhaps to have five thousand dollars from the council, from the Rangitiki District Council, and five thousand dollars from Horizons to put towards the maintenance within the reserve. I assume you meant, and uh, so is that something you've obviously got a, a committee there? Would you be looking to create an MOU with the council? Um, so I think if we did a reserve management plan, it would I would have thought be encompassed and under that that actually it's the plan that's being funded and how we do that, because we contract, like I'm going to the environmental group do some of the work for us. Um, the drone spraying team do some of that. We do thousands of community hours in land-based training use as a training site. So I think what he will <coughs> the reserve management plan umbrella would, would make that happen. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my question was along the lines of this funding as well and inquiring as to who it would be funded by. For instance, within our different district, we have a number of river catchment collectives, et cetera, that, that are rated, well, sometimes not through council, but effectively everybody contributes from within that catchment. Um, or are you thinking that this should be just part of the general rate take for the district and apportionment to you? How do you see that being? I suppose I would see it as that because I see it as a, um, it's identified as a threatened and rare area within our region and it's the only coastal wetland reserve that we have in our region. So I would have said that it's it's actually our region's. So regional interest. Okay. Interest. Thank you. I'll go to Council Wilson. I have another question, but I'll come back to that. Just very quickly. Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, I know the area, uh, and I know where the domain is that you refer to, that you're suggesting having that um, zone changed into um, into reserve. Unless I'm wrong, but the, would that not effectively stop any future development in that area of uh, Koiriata, full stop? 
in the spatial plan essentially says that Kiwiti Arts is going to stay kind of like it like it is at the moment, except for maybe development in the Papakanga block. So that I suppose is a yes. There is still land there, there's two or three sections that sit in another area that's council owned as well, that potentially still could be subdivided. But with changes to when they were first set up, we didn't have all that, that septic tank issue that we've got now that you have to have such big sections for all the runoff and that kind of stuff. So it changes, I suppose, changes the, the dynamic of that a little bit. So, Keith, we are at time. Yep. Um, but if you can answer this within 15 seconds, um, when you talk about the lack of civil defence equipment, um, do you have specifics <coughs> within that? So we have got some uh, portable pumps out there, but I was talking to Keith on the way in, and we don't have enough of the hose, like the, the suction hose, suction okay. hose to thank be able you. to do that <coughs> in a big area. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next submitter is Neville Palmer. Um, he's withdrawn, thank you. And then we go to um, Felicity Wallace, interested residents of Martin and the Rangatike. Um, Felicity, you're submitting on the annual plan and community spatial plan. What I'll do is give you 10 minutes on the annual plan, including questions relating to that. Yeah. And then you'll get 10 minutes maximum on the spatial plan and questions relating to that. Yeah, so can I'll I do the spatial the plan first? Certainly. Yeah. That's your call. Um, so you have 10 minutes, including that question time, how you handle that small concern. Yeah. Um, go for it. Okay. Um, I'll partially read my submission and then partially have time for questions, and I'll do the spatial plan first. <clears throat> first of all, I need to identify myself as the partner of Simon Loughton, which you probably all know, um, and I can confirm that Simon has taken no part in either of these submissions. Um, kia ora koutou, ko Felicity Wallace, aho. I'm a registered architect, and I live and um, I work around this region and around the country. I'm also the Western Director for Te Kahui Whaihanga New Zealand Institute of Architects. However, this submission is not made in that capacity. These, these submissions are made in my role as Chairperson for IRMA, interested residents of Martin and Rangataki. Thank you for the opportunity to um, make these submissions. On the spatial plan, um, I'd just like to say in previous submissions, we have advocated for the development of a spatial plan to inform proposed development in this area, and we support the work that Council is <coughs> undertaking in this regard. We're really pleased that Council's made a start on this process. However, we would really like to see more critical information inform this process and the plan. So we see that the plan has lots of good ideas, but how do you do it? So how you actually achieve some of these things um, and how what's the most appropriate thing for our particular region and our towns and, and surrounding countryside. So we think that the plan needs to show the spatial relationship that Rangataiki District has with surrounding districts, Whanganui, Ruapehu, Manawatu, and the links with Taranaki, Horofenua, Kapiti, Wellington and Hawke's Bay. So we have different types of relationships with those areas. Our plan needs to be a little bit more than, than a flat map like this, which doesn't really give us any idea of the countryside or our region. So we also need to show our maunga and our rivers and our tributaries. So we need to understand where those begin they need to be understand, identified and understood as key spiritual and physical forces imparting, impacting on our region and its growth. So those are really fundamental forces and they're not shown here. We've just got this very flat diagram with, with words here. So I understand it's been a huge amount of work to commence and it's great to see a start, but we would really like, we think these are fundamental forces that should be shown here and understood. 
So our marae need to be identified along park, alongside the Pākehā settlements. So there's very few marae identified here. We would like to see the environmental qualities of our region and our towns more clearly identified on the spatial plan. So the plan needs to show the topography, the soil quality, the hydrology, the catchment patterns of Rangataiki. Where do our winds come from? For example, you know, you need to understand that we have some really fundamental drivers for how we might develop our towns. It makes absolutely no sense to have main entrances to significant buildings coming from the south. You know, all our cold winds come from the southeast. Our prevailing winds are westerly, although I've got to say they're all over the place now. We have, you know, we need to understand for each site what are the drivers. Let's determine what areas are best for new development and how development can be enhanced for long-term resilience. We think the council needs to be actively planning for climate change. So there's potential for the spatial plan to show how to enhance earlier natural land patterns and settlements. The spatial plan needs to identify our places of refuge such as marae and community halls. Those are really strong identifying buildings within our rural communities. So the plan on page five shows state highways one and three as the defining link between settlements and it separates rural Rangatike in a box from the small rural towns. Now Rangatike is entirely rural. There is basically no difference between our towns and our countryside. You know, our towns are service towns. So you have to ask, is Martin or should it ever be a boutique town? Again, you need to understand what's the relationship that we have with Wanganui, which has developed itself. You know, I mean, when I was growing up in Wanganui, the flash part of town was up at the top, which is now the poorer, more rundown side of town. And the bottom of town was a dump, it was struggling. So, you know, towns evolve over time and Wanganui will have problems with its flooding and its catchment. They need to understand how to deal with that. Palmerston North, again, Palmerston North is, you know, a commercial, um, it, it's a very family focused, it's got a great energy. So we need to understand what's our relationship, what's our relationship with our headwaters for our rivers and taupo and the mountains, you know, we need to understand what the defining characteristics of our communities are in order to develop. So we would like to see consideration of how rural towns design for new housing, for example, street layouts, you know, cul-de-sacs. Cul-de-sacs are hugely isolating. So when you think about how you might develop a rural town, you need to think who needs to access that town? How do they get into these buildings that we want to create? Who are the communities that we are serving and what is our future? Um, how can we improve the connections and the pathways? How can we make it easier for people to visit? How can, you know, small things lead to big things. Big things lead to debt and they make it hard to do small things. You need to think, how can we make small improvements all the time? So the submission is made in support of the key themes. These are all important, how, however, they appear as generic terms. So, all cities want to have their town centres revitalised. All cities want high quality infrastructure and a thriving local economy, a connection with the natural environment. Everyone wants better transport and housing growth. Martinas and, and the Rangataki is in a far better situation than places like Auckland. The problems are far less complex. We are actually a very well-off community. We all have very easy access to most things. So I think you need to understand the community in order to design for the community. Providing more information that specifically relates to our rural region will inform the spatial plan and identify the physical, associative and perceptive qualities of our environment to encourage development that will enhance our communities. Any questions, anybody? Questions with regard to spatial plan only, <coughs> councillors? I have one from me, Felicity. Um, you'll be aware 
that the RMA is reforming um, to um, presume you yeah, sorry, can be so presumptive to three different set acts of parliament and um, the spatial planning component will become a regional decision, not ours. <coughs> In terms of the regional parts of your submission, do you see that being taken up within the, those new acts? Or do you think? I don't think anybody knows exactly how, the, I understand it's gonna take at least 10 years for those to come and act, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that when you are thinking about how you might develop a spatial plan, you need to think beyond the small boundaries of each town, that you need to understand what the relationship is with the wider area. So, yeah, I mean, at the moment, the council has to still put their best foot forward. I guess that's the view of the Spatial Planning Act. Councillor Kalkin. Um <clears throat> Thank you for this. This has um, been really, really valuable. Uh, my question is just around your commentary for um, consideration of how our rural towns should look um, <coughs> for new housing, and you've specifically called out cul-de-sacs. Yeah. Are there other parts of the layout that you... Um, would call out, or is it specifically the cul-de-sacs? That's just one example, I think. I think, and this is probably putting my architect's hat on, that um, I, I would really encourage the council to speak to landscape designers and urban designers and, and discuss these issues, because when you think, I, I, I mean, it's private developers who obviously own a site and it's it's an easier layout for them to create a cul-de-sac. I really understand that. But if you're a council thinking about how you might drive growth and development, you need to be thinking about how the people in your communities get from place to place and how they could be connected, whether they're driving, whether they're walking and you know, I guess cul-de-sacs have a lot of issues, like when, whenever you drive down, every every house gets headlights, mm. for example, simple things like that. Whereas if you've got, you know, people call it a grid pattern, but you see that you find those patterns in nature. So it's, it's great when people are driving or walking and they have a choice. I might go this direction, I might go that direction, I'll call in and see this person. Those are all the things that connect a community. And that's, we're, yeah. We're running over time. Okay, yeah, I can get on to the... Annual plan. Okay. And your time starts now. Thank you. Right. Uh, so the annual plan submission on behalf of Irma. Um, Irma advocates for a group of residents living in Martin and the wider Rangataiki who hold a strong affinity and commitment to the land and people of Rangataiki district, its health and well-being. We wish to see our district grow and flourish, but not at the cost of the amenity and environment that make this area a special place to live. We support environmentally best practice development and protection of Rangataki district, including its rural environment and communities, its flora, fauna, endangered species and soils. This submission is made in support of the proposed fully restored and earthquake strengthened Taihepi Town Hall Civic Centre, option one, and the new pathway along Calico Line from Natawa School to Martin. This submission is made in opposition to the proposed Martin Civic Centre at the junction of High Street and Broadway, <coughs> options one and two, the proposed rates increase and the proposed RDC debt levels. Irma supports the full restoration and strengthening of the Taihepi Town Hall, including new heating and ventilation systems and compliance with fire and accessibility requirements to improve all spaces. Irma supports the Council to commit $1 million towards the earthquake strengthening and refurbishment of the Taihepi Memorial Park Grandstand. Irma considers that the Taihepi Town Hall and the Taihepi Memorial Park Grandstand are significant and memorable buildings within the Taihepi Town landscape, and that their restoration will contribute to community well-being and also encourage further private development within the Rohi. The new pathway along Calico Line from Natawa School to Martin 
RMR supports the design of a new safe pathway from Ngātaua School to Martin. We consider this pathway should be designed to provide an attractive and safe mobility connection from the school into the town. Um, the current access is simply a gravel berm and is extremely dangerous. We think this is an opportunity for the council to demonstrate care towards its citizens and create a beautiful, thoughtfully landscaped introduction to Martin for all those travellers who take the Calico Line Road into the town or bypass our town to head towards Wanganui, Fielding or State Highway 1. Iremar considers that this relatively small spend should be increased but should be funded through a grant as per the footpath to Huntley School on the Wanganui Road. This is a perfect example of the work that council should be supporting to enhance our town. Some of our members are also concerned that other areas of Martin are not well served by footpaths and would like to see the footpath issue and access <coughs> considered as a whole. So not, not just the link from Natawa School. Um, personally, I'm very concerned for the safety of the Natawa students. I think it's a high risk for the council. And just, yeah, I'm always concerned when I see those young girls walking into town and I know that they're all keen to really get out and go somewhere. So I think there's a real opportunity there for council to support that work. Irma opposes the proposed Martin Civic Centre at the junction of High Street and <coughs> Options 1 and 2 on the basis that the proposal costs have now grown to an excessive level. We think that the nature of this proposal is inappropriate for its location for a small country town and region. The site includes several heritage buildings we think that are better suited for development by private interests. We ask what type of building is appropriate for the nature of housing local government within a rural region? We think that question needs to be asked. The site, the proposed <coughs> site down on the corner of Broadway and High Street is a flood hazard zone, making it subject to possible flood risk during emergency times when council activity is of high importance. Iroma submits that the current site for the Rangataiki District Council offers a far better development opportunity. The existing <coughs> site is easily accessed and is not within a flood hazard zone. We're also concerned about provision for the emergency management base. Currently, it's housed within an earthquake building at these existing buildings. So we would like to see that given priority in terms of planning. We think that council should focus on providing and maintaining community services and that embarking on the role of a developer would be at odds with the prime regulatory function of council. Overall, we think it's not appropriate to look at such a risk, high risk development, especially given signal changes to local government. Irma opposes any rate increases beyond 5% and also opposes count council debt levels exceeding $40 million. And we're concerned here about not just the capital cost, but council's ability to maintain assets. So it's just that long-term <coughs> vision. So we'd, we'd like to see more work on understanding what is actually appropriate for this council to be proceeding with. We, we support development, we understand there are issues with the building and safety for staff, and that's really critical, but we'd like to see more work go into what understanding what council really needs. Any questions? Councillors, questions? Councillor Morn, Councillor Duncan, Councillor Morn. Um, I'm just interested in how many uh, people in your organisation are residents Martin, I'm not sure, so 15 to 20. 15 to 20. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Duncan. My question is around, thank you, um, thank you for your submission. Um, my question is around the the walkway for the girls from Nautawa, <coughs> predominantly, although there are more houses being built down there, I understand. Um, so given the financial constraints and the fact that you don't want our rates to go up, um, but you, you, you say we should create a beautiful, thoughtfully landscaped introduction to Martin, which I totally agree with. 
Can you see what is proposed as a sensible first step um, in, in trying to mitigate the, the danger of the girls walking down that way without putting more expense on the, on the um, Rangatike District Council? And their ratepayers, of course. Yeah, that's right. <coughs> um, I guess I would really encourage the council to get a landscape architect to look at the issue even so... I, I mean, it needs a real brainstorm between the school and council for how those girls get safely. It may be that there are other means of doing that. So that's a set for issue. I, I would encourage the council to actually take a broader view and get it done properly. Yeah, because, you know, it might not be that much more money. Yeah. Um, question from me. In terms of this the replacement for this building. There, there seems to be two messages you're giving us. One is don't do it, that it is too expensive. But the second message is that you want it done on another site. How do you, we, where's we, the relevance in these two positions? Um, we think it's um, the site down at the junction is really unsuitable, high risk, really, Particularly now with the changes to local government, we see this site as ideal for development. You know, I've actually, I have done a scheme with Bruce Dixon of Wanganui a long time ago. Um, so I am reasonably familiar, um, but obviously the circumstances have changed. I think that council should work with the architect that they have submitted or uh, have arrangements with, um, but invite, you know, this is a more suitable site. It's much less risk, council owns, owns the land. So yeah, council needs to do something about safe accommodation for staff. But it's so, the so amount of money and the risk and the lack of confidence you can have in proceeding. So I take it from that, you're saying that yes, we do need to find a solution, but it has to be between the two sites, it has to be affordable, etc. As RMA, as a group, we we think we, we don't support the proposal that's currently being submitted for options one or two on that site, but we do support development on this site. We see that as much lower risk. Well, I think we've got a flurry of hands. Mm -hmm. I'll go Councillor Morn, <laughs> Councillor Wilson, Councillor Duncan, um, and we only have a minute left. Okay, so considering you... Please... Yeah. Um, your question needs to be really sharp. Your answer needs to be What would you sharp. do with the site on High Street and Bro corner of High Street and Broadway? Sell it. <clears throat> question, Councillor Wilson. You support in your spatial plan the, um, uh, the <clears throat> development of the town centre. How do you do that? No, I've mentioned that we supported those wish lists, but you've got to ask, is, what is a town centre now? So you need to ask the really big questions all around the world. Cities, towns are struggling with what it means to actually create communities. So it's really not appropriate to be investing a huge amount of money on a high risk site where you may not see much progress for many years. Okay, we'll call it quits there. Thank you very much for your submission. <coughs> we'll move on. And I'll just warn um, the submitters, mm. we do have some councillors that have to leave um, mm. reasonably soon. Um, Mr Whitaker, John, your time is now. <laughs> Ah, but I'll be short and sweet. I'm not going to get too in-depth or anything. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Right, yo, okay. Now, onto the, uh, the frame part and the options. I think with Thai Happy, it would probably better, be better to improve all the buildings in option two. And I, don't, I think most of the population up there would be in favour of that rather than one or, one or the other. Um, and then on to the Martin Council building. I think the, uh, you've only really given us two options, but I'm sure there are other options as regards this, this side here as well. 
<laughs> and the flooding risk is quite quite high. But if you are going to use option one, and I go for option one, um, the new building needs to be something that looks part of a hundred years ago, like Fielding's um, Manchester Square Dadara building that was demolished, and now it looks something that resembles a hundred years ago. Nothing like that Bull's place that doesn't look anything like a hundred years ago, if you know what I mean. The walking pathway, I think we should get in and do it. That's um, for that. Right. The other thing that I mentioned in my submission, I'm not sure whether it was the spatial one or not, was section sizes. I think there should be some flexibility with the council, with people who want to subdivide their properties. If they want the nice big lawn, well, that's fine and dandy. But if they want to subdivide it, there needs to be a little bit of flexibility with, with what they can do. I know in Auckland they've got really small sizes and three-storey buildings and all this sort of stuff. I don't know whether that's, those regulations will be rolled out here or not, or whether they're still applicable or, or, or how it works. It's an operational matter, so it's for you guys. But I'm sure it's cheaper for the council to utilise the services in the road that are already there to, uh, to br and, and increase the number of sections. And the, uh, the next part that goes along with that, there seems to be more tiny houses going in, things that are self-contained. Do they really need to have services at the, at the boundary, the power and the water and the sewerage? That, does that really need to be a requirement so you can subdivide? So it's something to think about. Now, <laughs> what else have we got? <coughs> Community housing. I think we should, if, if the council is, is able to increase the number of pensioner houses. We have um, quite a, an issue with homeless people in Martin. And I don't know whether the council could improve, put some money towards that, or whether it might just be a, um, a note to Housing Corp and say, well, why don't you build some houses here? I believe there's no Housing Corporation houses in Martin. So that, would, that, that could be a solution with no cost to the council. Um, and I think also that... There are um, organisations that are servicing the homeless and the needy, like the Martin Food Pantry. There's quite a crowd that goes up there every week. Um, and I think they are really struggling to get donations for money to buy the food, as well as all the helpers that go with it and, and bits and pieces. Um, railways, I know... Uh, Mayor Andy has been, has mentioned a few times talking to different people and organisations in Kiwi Rail about passenger services. I think it's going to happen. There's a meeting coming up very soon in Wanganui about it. So um, let's hope so. Um, the uh, rail hub down at the other side of the station there, I hope it goes ahead. It'd be quite good if it does. But there's no log trains coming from Wanganui now. It all goes by trucks. So you've got to wonder, don't you? Um, what else have I done? <laughs> Ten minutes, John. You've got about five minutes left. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> you don't have to use it all. But <laughs> yeah. got that time. Are, there, are there any questions? <laughs> any, any, any thoughts on what I've said? If you're asking for questions... Uh, I have questions from councillors, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Councillor Carter. Are regarding uh, allowing small size sections, are you aware of the size of a minimum section at the moment? No, I'm not, actually. I, uh, I inquired with a, with a real estate agent um, a while back, and he said, oh, no, you couldn't do it here. But there's, there's um, the section... I think on the corner of Duke and Wings Line, it's a full section. And I don't think that's, that's subdivisable as well. But I'm not actually up to date with how many metres I'm allowed, yeah. 
well, people are allowed, but it, it, it should really be given an, an option for, yeah, for residents. <coughs> um, just with the section on whether or not services are required at the gates for tiny homes, um, without them, what do you do? Well, they, become, they get certified self-contained. But what about the, the, the um, sewage and waste? The sewage gets gets taken to the um, dump station. The water uh, the water is collected from the roof, or they buy a buy a thousand litre box or whatever it is container, and the power every it, it, it's, it's very popular now to have two or three solar panels, and be completely yeah self contained. The Motorhome Association you'll see them they're hundred thousand dollar. Wagons going past, <laughs> so. Uh, mm -hmm. Councillor. Uh, along the same lines, thank you, Mr Whitaker. Um, so these housing regulations, you're asking for more flexibility, um, obviously for consenting and, and, and requirements. <coughs> so so you're, are you asking the council to um, have a greater um, appetite for risk around this no, sort of thing? No, not at all. Mm. I think the the standard for housing regulations is, is adequate and, and very good. There doesn't need to be any change with that. There was some mention in the in the booklets about uh, the standard of look or what the house looks like, but the actual building is, is governed by the Building Act, yeah. But the, the flexibility is with the services at the at the uh, at the boundary. Yeah. Hi. No further questions. Um, thank you very much, John, for your presentation. Thank you. We'll be moving on to the last presentation of the day, which can take could take up to twenty minutes. I know some of you councillors have to leave. <coughs> I prefer that you do so now rather than as part of a way through a submission in terms of of of, of manner. I do understand I do understand you have come up with this. So um, in the meantime, um, Caroline, if you'd like to make yourself Thank you, Carolyn. Um, in terms of the, you're submitting on the spatial plan and annual plan, which would you like to do first? Well, when I took the phone call from the, I think it was Sean at the front desk, he talked in terms of the community committee having 20 minutes to talk and it didn't um, differentiate between 10 minutes for one and 10 minutes for the other. Okay. So my thought is we have 20 minutes and he's actually going to do the talking on behalf of the community Some committee. Of it. Some <laughs> of it. Um, <laughs> she's no, the deputy I'll do chair. Is I'll, I will separate them out as two submissions. I will take it as a submission first from the, from the community committee. Mm -hmm. And if, if you are going to be presenting that, it's, it's just got to be very fair about how I treat different groups. We'll just do the community committee first and we'll focus on the annual. Yeah, so so in terms of that, you'll have 10 minutes, including question time, and then we'll take the second 10-minute block separately. Yeah, and I understand the second one is a private one from Carolyn. Yeah, yeah. So we've got 10 minutes of annual plan from the community committee, 10 minutes of spatial plan from the community committee, and then 10 minutes for my own. So it's 30 minutes, is that correct, the understanding from staff? Uh, yes. 10, 20, yeah. It is correct. That is correct. So it's 30 I minutes. Don't, I don't will take 30 minutes, however. <laughs> <laughs> Off you go. I'll go and speed talk. Kia ora koutou, ko Annie McDowell, toko ingoa. Um, Carolyn is chair, I'm co-chair of the Martin Community Committee. Um, 
we're here primarily, Carolyn will do her bit later, um, representing the people of Martin. And I want to be really clear about that. Our role and function is to advocate and be a voice for the collective community as a whole. Um, I've been thinking all day, we met as a committee last night in preparation for this. Two o'clock this morning, some of us finished. <laughs> Um, I've been thinking all day about what to say, and I want to share a little bit of an analogy for you first. I know it was a little bit less formal than what I've experienced so far. Um, <clears throat> my daughter came home yesterday and said, Mum, I learnt today what one plus one is. And I said, wow, you're eight. Really? She said, it's five. <clears throat> How do you work that out? She goes, well, if you turn five upside down, it's two. What's half of eight? Does anybody know? Uh, um, please, yeah, I'm just, you yeah, need I'm, to speak to your submission. Yeah, I am. Yep. What's half of eight? It's not four. It's three. Everybody in our community has a different view, perception, and interpretation of circumstances. So I just want to set that as a, that's our foundation. We represent everybody. Um, so... Employed, unemployed, homeless, working, counsellors, we're here to re represent everybody. In terms of the annual plan, um, <coughs> we support option one in terms of Tai Happy and the Town Hall Civic Centre. In terms of the Martin Civic Centre, we prefer something else. And there's been a number of things historically, Carolyn will be able to elaborate, but um, options that could be done on this land so that we can maintain our main street for development, um, growth, business, economic focus. Um, in terms of Calico Line, we also prefer something else, not opposed to the walkway, but we also understand that there are whanau, families, children, tamariki, rangatai, walking to school in our public schools who don't have adequate footpaths and adequate crossings or safe places. My own children go to school, bike to school, crossroads in unsafe spaces, not because I'm a bad mother, but because as a town, we don't have the adequate crossings. Um, so yes, totally respect the need for a walkway for Natawa, but that said, we're also talking about funding families and whānau who are often out of town and don't invest in our town directly either. Yet we've got people on benefits, taxpayers living in our town, investing in our town, who don't have adequate footpaths, walkways themselves. Um, the community committee are really passionate about focusing on getting our basic infrastructure right. We've got a cost of living crisis. We've got um, huge amounts of financial distress on families within our community. We don't need to be putting more burden on our ratepayers simply for the added luxuries. We need to get back to basics and look after our people. And when I say our people, we're talking about the elderly our whānau on benefits, our immigrants, our people who have grown, lived and breathed Martin for their life. We need to get back to the basics and look after our people. And those of us who came here, who chose to move here and find a place is worse now than when we moved here, let's say 10 years ago. <coughs> Oh, yeah, we've talked about water, but basically water, the sooner the better. <laughs> Let's sort it out. But actually, also when it comes to water, recycling. How many people in Martin are buying bottled water and not recycling? It's counteractive, actually. That's about it, I think, for that Yep, annual plan, done. Are you happy to take questions on the annual plan? We can, yep. <coughs> Councillor Um, Thank you. 
for your submission on behalf of the community committee. Um, you, you spoke many times about this concept of back to basics. Um, I'd be interested to hear in your thoughts what that looks like from a council perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, I come back to it. it we talk about um, the recycling thing is a really basic one, I guess, to think about. Um, we can go all environmentally friendly and upgrade fleets and talk about electric vehicles and all the rest of it. We don't even support our own whānau. And when I say whānau, I'm talking about Martin community to recycle. People can't afford to hop in the car and drive to the dump to recycle their stuff, right? So it goes in the bin, goes into landfill. We're not doing anything for the greater good. Um, I think when it comes to buildings, is it really necessary to have the flashy building? Or is there something we can do that's cheaper that means that we can support our community to grow? And when I, I'm very passionate, I'm a social worker, <laughs> I'm very passionate about ensuring that we look after the whole spectrum of people, not just the farmers or not just the beneficiaries, but everybody. So how do we make decisions that are inclusive? Why does Nataba get a road, but not Martin Primary School or James Cook? Or how do we include everybody? <coughs> Further questions, councillors? Councillor Targeti. Yeah. Um, thank you for taking the time to submit. Uh, do you think that uh, um, once the Natawa Road um, footpath is, is built, which would connect to the Kalakarai footpath, do you think there would be a attractive walkway for the township? I think it would be attractive. Is it going to, my question back would be, at what percentage of our community are going to use that? And of our vulnerable people in our community, how many of those are going to use that? Thank you. Further questions? No, okay, we'll move to reset and we'll go through to this community committee uh, spatial plan submission. Mm -hmm. And the time is yours. Um, Councillor Dalgetty, I know that you needed to get away. I had said it would be potentially 20 minutes. Um, oh, uh, no, well, okay. that's fine. Thank, no you. Thank you. Please proceed. Sorry, just reading the notes. Um, Yeah, in terms of the spatial plan, again, I think we've probably covered a lot of it in the earlier, is around how do we make Martin attractive, our main street, bring back business to community, um, enable businesses to thrive, enable families to thrive. We've talked a lot in the community committee around how do we support, enable and create space for our vulnerable. And when we talk about vulnerable, I'm talking about our young people, We've heard about it, we've seen it on the news, we had it at Z not so long ago, the ram raids, right through to our elderly. Um, so how do we create spaces that um, enable a thriving community? How do we bring business to town? Um, and business which is, uh, I had a <coughs> today around businesses that are affordable. It's all very well to have boutique shops but does that meet the needs of everybody? But if we don't create the space for other shops to meet the needs of other people in our community, how are we actually responding and meeting to our community and society as a whole? Um, we want to ensure, we've talked a lot about the, within the community committee around um, partnership and how um, the council and in the spatial plan, we're actually involving different groups and, and not tokenistic consultation, but inclusive consultation, and actually take that beyond consultation, but partnership. So can we have this conversation? Like we're, we're here going, you've got 10 minutes. Actually, if we're in partnership, we have a conversation and it takes as long as it takes. 
So if we're going to respect the mana of people, we all deserve that honour and respect. Um, and I really challenge that to the council, respect the mana of our people. And that's every community in our town. Is consultation. I picked up, and funnily enough, I picked up a, um, I was in the library and picked up one of the annual plans. It was two years old. And sitting in the library is current. How is that respectful consultation? Can I pop in? After the closing of, after the deadline of the submissions, I went into the library and talked to Mel. Excuse me a second, it's going to stop there. Are you what, Carolyn, you're doing your own submission? Well, this is part of the community yeah, to you, build in. Yeah, I'm sorry, but you said I went in. I just, I just don't want a double duplication around this. Um, in short, look, in short, I've been into the library twice now to pick up consultation documents and they were years old. That's not good enough. That's not respectful consultation with community. I would expect from the council that true partnership exists and that requires time. Not 10 minutes, you're out. That's me done. Um, questions around the spatial plan community committee? Yeah. Um, in your utopia, how would Martin Broadway Town Centre look? Like, how would you, you know, we're grabbling with this as a council. Yeah, how, oh, we, yeah. how we get it right. I mean, you all know I ran for council. I think, I think about this a lot. Okay. Um, so I, I would like to see... Two the, or three quick, quick yep. fixes. I would like to see um, some buildings restored. I know some of them are owned by people outside of town, um, and that's not that straightforward to fix it. Um, I would like to see businesses provided opportunities that are accessible to operate. Um, we're seeing businesses open and close on a daily. It, it's it's not that exciting to watch, to be honest. No. Um, we've got, and I was talking to somebody today, something like 800 houses been approved to be built in terms of development. Do we have the infrastructure and the businesses that support that? Hopefully, if the people come in, we have more money to. Well, fingers mm -hmm. crossed. Yeah. But we have to forward think that. I'm, you know. I'm sorry, no, Councillor, Council, you can't ask, you need to ask a question. Well, well I've asked a question, question and that. But then you followed up with your comments. Yeah. They need to be questions. Um, I have a question in terms of uh, your comments around respecting the mana in 10 minutes, and I'd certainly <laughs> get that. But did you take part in any one of the other meetings that there wasn't um, a restriction on 10 minutes? There were, so there were a huge number of, of spatial plan meetings throughout the district. So, so I'm, I'm well aware of the, I'm well aware of a number of meetings personally. So I'm, in terms of the Martin Community Committee, people have attended. So I'm, I'm sitting here on behalf of the community committee personally. I've had many other things going on in my life. No, no I haven't. No, that's fine. But committee members. But committee members, committee members have absolutely attended. Yeah. But, I, but I do think, I mean, we're volunteers. John's sitting here. Carolyn's sitting here. I'm sitting here. We were up till 2 o'clock last night, this morning. People have already left. Where's the respect? Councillor Kalkin. Um just referring back to the submission um, that you provided to us and um, you've said here RDC should be the leader um, when it comes to Martin Town Centre. Can you just explain to me for, for further understanding what you mean by being the leader with a site that the RDC owns, what you're expecting of us as the leader? with that particular site. Sorry, I'm just trying to find what you've... Um, uh, page talk, one of three. When we talked around the committee that we've had, the, the view was from quite a few of us, from people that we've talked to, has been 
being there as a lead doesn't necessarily mean to take up a whole chunk of a retail location. <coughs> so you don't necessarily have to lead from the front, you can lead from the back and achieve an awful lot more. Supplementary question is your option. <laughs> You're not yes. talking physical leadership, are you? Like, no, but presence. I didn't think that Jared was meaning that. No. <laughs> no. Thank you. Further questions from councillors? No, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And we respect the position of the community committee, of course. No, you're we now you're right, right now, get off the I just need to <laughs> make my sure, duty. I just need to make sure in terms of process I get this right. Are you wanting to speak on the spatial plan and the annual plan separately, or are you...? It's probably all going to meld in together. Thank you. Yep. So you have 10 minutes, how you use it, it's yours. Go for it. So on consistency, and that's something that I struggle with with the Council, we've got one rule for one group, as in the Martin Community Committee, we've got to have two separate 10 minutes, and mine can be all together, but that's just my thought. Um, the <coughs> civic centre, I see that it needs to be affordable and practical. And on our way here, our way be being because I picked up Annie knowing that parking can sometimes be a challenge here. We took a drive by and I counted 39 vehicles outside the building on you know, the adjoining streets. <coughs> When there were discussions about building on the corner of Broadway years back, it had eight car parks. So I challenge you, well, how on earth are you gonna get what was potentially then eight car parks and get 39 vehicles today in there? That just doesn't compute as far as I'm concerned. And to put a building into a flood zone, it says to me, seriously, does everybody get a suit? waders if i can be somewhat flippant but you know i do not see the practicality of putting a significant building such as council needs into a flood prone location you will have seen my diagram that i attached there are more than adequate ways of building on the land you've got here and when you consider from my knowledge on this plot of land <coughs> we've got a house that's not occupied at the moment and we've got people needing housing in town it just doesn't gel with me on the calico line um path i in principle i agree that it's a great idea to have a path from the school to get the girls into town but how long will it be before places like the stretch of Canteen Street that doesn't have any paths on it? And you've got a, um, a school <coughs> that takes young kids to get along that way. I think do the Calico Line path after you've got at least a path along all of a street in town. I'm not saying every street has to have a path on each side, but at least make sure that all the existing streets in town, somebody can walk from one end to the other along a sealed surface of some description. On the various things I've seen, and this has gone on from my opinion for many years the general lack of detail you ask questions do you agree with that but you don't give the people easy access to the information i cite easy access in the last week i've looked on the website looking at consultation documents for long-term plans are there looking for consultation for annual plan documents there aren't any so you go how do we know what was asked and what it transpired to over several years? And as Annie said earlier, she got an old um, consultation document. Based on that, I, whether 
Mayor Andy thinks it's me personally or me as chair of the community committee, went into the library to investigate, and this happened after the deadline, the documents that were available for anyone to take away were year two and we're doing year three. So I wonder how many people have been reading the wrong documents. I'm sure somebody internally would be able to do the maths, but that doesn't bode well in my mind in the way of improving communications. The lack of consistency to get the message out is something that I have struggled with long and hard. And just as an example, if I am in an organisation that's looking for funding, and I look at this relatively new funding document, and it talks about different types of funding being events, community initiatives, creative communities, um, Sport New Zealand, Parks Upgrade, and I go, well, hang on, somebody at the community committee said that they've got money. Where is that funding opportunity for whether I'm wearing my diabetes committee hat or my brain injury board hat? Lack of having the information is not at all helpful. So if the information's not getting put out there, how do you expect the community to have a conversation with you about various things and having a conversation in a big issue back to the um, corner of Broadway. In the, sorry if I get my notes, in the long-term plan for 2021 to 2031, on page 27, if my notes are right, it has been agreed that targeted consultation with the public on all the options needs to occur first. I do not see that what's been done this year comes anywhere close to targeted consultation. Tick a couple of box to me. Your spatial plan has been more like targeted consultation. Or am I missing something here? I think I'm getting close to my 10 minutes. Does anybody yeah, have any got questions? But that includes question time. Anybody got any questions so Quest far? Questions from councillors. Councillor Wilson. Um, forgive me if I'm wrong because your name is attached to multiple applications with the, the different hats here. Mm -hmm. But the question around forestry, is this your personal one about include everyone and not discriminate? Is that, was that yours or was that from the previous... It probably was mine because I was not impressed to read in the forestry um, document of uh, the forestry words to um, consult with iwi and the forestry industry. And I'm like, well, there's actually more than those two portions of our community that are affected by the ongoing um, outcomes <coughs> of forestry activities. Because if you've got a forestry truck that's doing damage to the road, any of us could be affected by that, couldn't we? Uh, yes, just mm. supplementary question. Su su supplementary, are you aware of what that um, consultation with those two groups was about? No, I have to admit I don't. But when I read the, the words, it's like you talk about only speaking to some of the affected people and that's how I see it and if I'm seeing it wrong maybe we're back down to some more education needs to take place because that's something that you will know directly I've rattled on with for a long time no, that's, that's I, my question, thank you. and on the education I will leave with Peter my suggested signage of things to go in toilets because something that has driven me mad for decades it's not just since i came to the rangatiki you go to use a public facility there's a problem and there's no way to report it um if, if it needs to be part of the submission process are you suggesting that's a table document to yes. to yeah. council and mm -hmm. we can certainly receive it that's fine and you refer to footpaths. Yes. Um, how many streets 
don't have a footpath, at least on one side where there's housing. I don't know because I haven't actually in the last week done a drive round, but this morning when I was out, there is part of um, <coughs> Canteen Street where there is not um, paving on either side. There are different streets in the town where you go so far down and there's a path on one side of the road and then there's a path on the other side of the road and if you think for youngsters going to going to or from school that's certainly not safe because even though i don't have kids i do appreciate they get to an age where they go mom i just want to walk to school myself and mum goes i don't like that because you're not old enough but if they can't have a safe space to walk when they're younger that is not going to be beneficial to everybody especially when you think the young mums with babes and push chairs taking the older brother or sister to school the young mums struggle because they actually have to walk on the road so, and I, I i'm happy to provide you with a list but i'm sure the roading team can do the same <sighs> but i struggle to think a pathway for high school students at an area that to me i view as out of town is looked at it getting priority over somewhere in town which i view as canteen street or you know towards the bottom of wellington road there's a lack of um, pavements there and i'm sure it's not just martin you know in a rural district it's got to be in other places thank you i think you've answered the question and we can provide that detail to you councillor later I'm happy to have a conversation later on. Um, any further questions? Time for one more question, councillors. <coughs> no, look, um, Caroline, thank you very much for your submissions. Um, and um, we recognise the work that you do, obviously, as, as chair of community committee, etc. So thank you. Councillors, that brings us to the end of submissions for today, and we will resume at 9.30 tomorrow morning. 9.30 is 9.50. 9.30 is 9.50. We resume at 9.30 in the morning, councillors. Have we turned the audio off, please? Yeah.